Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Yap Ho Jen, Professor of Law and Director of the Center for Comparative and Public Law. Thank you for joining us today at a Civil Unrest in Hong Kong conference organized by the law faculty. We are humbled by the support you have shown us. We did not expect to change the venue. In fact, when term ended last year, rather early, we were worried whether this conference would, ever, would even come to pass. But and this is so especially, this, but given the fact that this is the first event organized by the law school since term ended, we are grateful that you are here with us today. Your presence shows that the mission of the law school remains relevant to the community, and I think it also shows and uh, testifies to the fact that the themes of today's conference has struck a chord and has resonated with the community and the university at large. The causes and consequences of today of the, unrise, the unrest is multifaceted, and because it is so, we have gathered together a team of social scientists, sociologists, political scientists, historians, and lawyers to come together to discuss different elements of the crisis. We cannot chart a viable path forward unless we take stock of our past, and so. For panel one, we have convened scholars who will be taking us through uh, the various unrest in Hong Kong, starting from the 1960s, 1967 uh, uh, riots. And then we'll look at Occupy and finally close with the current uh, uh, social movement. In panel two, we, would, we have the privilege of bringing to, uh, two UK scholars we have intimate experience working on the grounds in London and Ireland to bring, bring to us comparative insights on, uh, on, on what is happening in Hong Kong alongside the Hong Kong local experts. And they would discuss a very topical and potential fault line in our society. And that panel will be on youth, young people, policing, and transitional justice. In our final panel, and I hope you'll stay all the way to the end, we'll be having a dialogue session between the legal profession, law, uh, law academics, and law students. It is, before the event, I've actually asked all these students to come up with a list of questions they would like the panel to dis discuss. To maintain a sense of mystery, I'm not gonna review the questions now, but I've seen them and I know they are uh, prov uh, thought provoking and they, some of them are fairly challenging to answer. But we will discuss the questions together as a group. Right? It is a discussion, not a debate. So we will not try to score political points. We are nonpartisan. But what we hope is to represent the views held by the school, by the students, and by the profession. So on this note, I will, on behalf of the law faculty and my dean, Professor Fu Hualing, I thank you for your support and I'll pass the floor to Professor Albert Chen, who will be chairing and moderating the first panel. Thank you, Albert. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Yap, and uh, welcome to you all to this um, first, uh, actually it's the first public event the faculty is hosting since classes were suspended uh, in the mid middle of November and uh, the university uh, was uh, largely closed, uh, and now the uh, the second semester has just begun. Uh, is uh, yesterday we began teaching again, teaching again, and I'm very glad that uh, we are able to um, to hold this event today. Uh, as Professor Yap has pointed out, um, uh, this uh, conference is designed uh, not to be just uh, a legal legal study of the um, anti-extradition bill movement of 19, uh, of 2019, uh, but also uh, an interdisciplinary uh, uh, investigation uh, uh, involving sociologists, uh, political scientists, historians, uh, journalists, and others uh, into what uh, what happened, why it happened, and, uh, and the, the, the significance or implications of what happened uh, uh, in the uh, last few months. Uh, but I'm sure we all agree that no matter how, how we interpret uh, the events, 
uh, these events are probably the most um, significant, the most important events in the history of Hong Kong in the last uh, 50 years or so, uh, since the 1967 riots uh, and also since the handover in 1997. So, so as, uh, as scholars, um, as, as uh, a faculty of law, we believe that it is part of our, uh, our mission to, um, to uh, promote uh, scholarly investigation uh, of these uh, developments, which um, uh, stem actually from a legal development, uh, namely the introduction of a of an extradition or rendition arrangement um, as between Hong Kong and Taiwan, mainland China, and uh, over 170 countries. So um, th this panel, panel one, uh, will, um, will be held this morning. Uh, it will consist of presentations by six speakers, uh, followed by a Q&A uh, or general discussion session. So what I'll do is to introduce each speaker immediately before he or she is invited to speak. And each speaker will speak for uh, about 15 to 20 minutes. So uh, the speakers can, can speak either, either uh, in, in, uh, at, at the uh, uh, desk over there or, or here, uh, depending on uh, which you prefer. Uh, if you have a PowerPoint, uh, it would be better to speak here. Um, so, uh, may I first introduce our first speaker, Mr. Gary Jung, uh, who is uh, a journalist with the South China Morning Post. Uh, and he, he writes uh, uh, on matters of politics uh, and Hong Kong mainland uh, relationship. Um, for our purposes, uh, we are particularly uh, interested in uh, his work on uh, rights in the history of Hong Kong. He is the author of a book called Hong Kong's Watershed, the 1967 Riots, published by Hong Kong University Press uh, about 10 years ago. Um, by the way, we have a show, we have a, uh, uh, a showroom and bookstore of the Hong Kong University Press, just uh, five minutes walk from this building. So if you want to buy a copy of uh, Mr. Zhang's book, uh, I'm sure you can, uh, you can do it during lunchtime. So, um, so uh, we'll now invite uh, Mr. Jerome to, to speak to us. Uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, Professor Chen, for the introduction. Um, I'm honored to be the first speaker. and. Uh, um, when I wrote uh, the history on the 1967 votes, I was thinking, oh, it's just history. Uh, that's uh, sorts of uh, horrible things uh, may not happen again. Uh, but it seems uh, my uh, guess uh, is going wrong. Uh, now the situation may be overtaking what's happening, uh, what's uh, happened in 1967. Uh, we will see uh, how uh, the situation compare uh, 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 between now uh, and 1967. Um, the 1967 disturbances um, is one of the most controversial uh, events in Hong Kong history. Um, there are different interpretation uh, and evaluation of, of this uh, mayhem in Hong Kong. Uh, the Hong Kong government uh, or what uh, the leftist camp call uh, the colonial government, uh, call it uh, communist initiated uh, confrontation uh, in which uh, the left wing in Hong Kong sought to impose their will on the people by intimidating workers and fomenting work stoppages uh, and indiscriminate uh, violence such as uh, pumping of uh, bombs on streets. Uh, but um, uh, for, I think, nearly uh, half a century, uh, the left wing in Hong Kong still argued that uh, the disturbances were a virtuous mass movement in the wake of colonial oppression by the colonial government and had forced the government to introduce social reforms. 
Uh, and uh, even uh, how to label this event is subject to controversy. Uh, there are different, two different names. Uh, the P1997 governments uh, have been calling it uh, riots uh, or confrontation. But uh, the left wing in Hong Kong uh, still call it an anti-British and counter-violence movement or in uh, Mandarin, Fan Yin Kang Bao. Uh, uh, maybe let me uh, uh, introduce briefly what happened uh, in 1967. Um, the immediate trigger of the 1967s is a labor shortage in Sampo Kong in an artificial flower factory. Uh, this factory, uh, some people uh, uh, wrongly stated that it was owned by Mr. Li ka uh, some uh, outstanding academics and historians also say so, but I, I, my um, verification is, is wrong. Uh, it was owned by uh, an um, industrialist called uh, Duncan Tong. Um, and uh, um, what happened on May 6, 1967 is uh, 21 people workers were arrested uh, when a group of uh, uh, sex workers tried to prevent was leaving the factory and, uh, and then while police uh, intervened and arrest them. And uh, now we have uh, four, five demands. Uh, in those days, there are four demands. <laughs> uh, 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 they keep on um, fighting for this. Uh, largely speaking, is uh, stopping all unlawful arrest, trial, sentencing, and torture. Uh, uh, immediate release of all arrested, uh, what they call compatriots, Chinese. Uh, punishment of the culprits, uh, officials, and uh, police officers. Apology, etc. And uh, a guarantee of low repeat of similar incidents. And uh, the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs also lodged. Uh, similar demands to the uh, British Embassy at the time. Uh, but uh, uh, I need to emphasize that although the immediate trigger of uh, the wires was that industrial uh, dispute, uh, labor dispute, uh, the uh, larger picture is uh, this uh, event was actually mainly inspired by uh, the Chinese Communist Party's uh, support for the anti british struggle uh, gets uh, the backdrop of the Cultural Revolution, which happened in 1966. Uh, that's why I am always against uh, the left wing's argument that uh, uh, it was uh, chiefly, uh, mainly uh, uh, triggered by um, social conflicts or uh, deep rooted problems in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, the main uh, gesture of Beijing support uh, for this uh, mayhem uh, was uh, People's Daily uh, editorial on June 3rd, uh, 1967, which uh, uh, called on Hong Kong Chinese to be ready to respond to the call of the motherland to smash the reactionary rule of the British. And this is uh, the main content of the uh, 1967 uh, June 3rd editorial of uh, People's Daily. And uh, the situation uh, got worse uh, in uh, uh, July 8th. Uh, there were a, a serious uh, border conflict in Shadow Cove, uh, in which five Hong Kong policemen were uh, killed and 11 wounded. Um, uh, so Hong Kong came to the bank of uh, Lili being um, taken over by Beijing. Uh, if that really happened, there won't be any 1997 question. <laughs> uh, luckily, because of the uh, wisdom and intervention by um, Chinese Premier Zhuang Nai. Uh, he intervened in uh, December 1967 and uh, called on uh, 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 
the cadres in uh, officials in Hong Kong uh, to stop supporting the disturbances. So the situation gradually like, uh, died down and no more uh, bombs on streets. And this is some uh, pictures I uh, selected. Uh, it's about the conflict uh, during the 1967. This is uh, the Garden Road incident on May 23rd. Uh, the backdrop, uh, the venue here is uh, in an uh, old hotel which has been demolished. Um, uh, this is Hilton Hotel. And uh, it's interesting that uh, Hilton Hotel is now, uh, some people may not know, uh, Chiang Kong Center. Chiang Kong Center is the place where uh, something happened on Sunday. Uh, some protesters were, uh, were arrested here or and beaten. And this is uh, 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 the uh, police bomb disposal officer. Uh, uh, this is uh, so-called homemade uh, uh, bombs uh, uh, produced by the leftists. Uh, they put it in the in the in the bottle uh, for gentleman's uh, uh, hairdresser. And uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the 1967 uh, riots were um, mainly the product of uh, cultural revolution being exported to Hong Kong. And uh, my view is, uh, obviously, uh, such a large-scale uh, mayhem couldn't have taken place in Hong Kong if the uh, cultural revolution had not happened in the mainland uh, earlier. And uh, uh, one of the strongest proof uh, uh, is that uh, uh, one year before 1967 riots, uh, there were another incident in Hong Kong. Uh, there was a uh, five cent, five cent, uh, fair wise. Uh, five cents in those days may may be tantamount to I reckon uh, maybe uh, five or six dollars in uh, uh, currency uh, uh, between ferry service. Uh, uh, between Central and Jim Sa Chui, it uh, triggered um, another riot, uh, Star Ferry Vault. Uh, it was uh, uh, mainly uh, uh, originating from uh, grievances among young people and general public, uh, which is not uh, politically motivated. But it was interesting that uh, at that time, uh, the left wing um, uh, took a neutral stance and even uh, uh, supported the colonial government to support, uh, to suppress uh, the disturbances. Uh, they even went uh, some editorial uh, to call on Hong Kong people to support uh, the colonial government to uh, restore order. So, uh, uh, it's uh, obvious that um, Beijing support for the left wing in 1967 uh, is the major reason for situation getting out of control in 1967. And uh, um, nowadays, um, some people argue that um, the 1967 um, was mainly uh, sparked by uh, social contradiction in Hong Kong. Uh, and we have to uh, go back to the nature of the 1967. Uh, my view is it was not a popular protest originating from civil society in Hong Kong. Uh, there were uh, uh, indeed some uh, sympathizers uh, outside the leftist camp before the left wing resorted to uh, violence, but um, uh, the major participants uh, are mainly confined to those from the left wing. So, uh, to put it simple, it was mainly a spillover of the Cultural Revolution in mainland China. And uh, the situation uh, uh, once got to the point that the uh, British government um, uh, deliberated the possibility and feasibility of withdrawal from Hong Kong since May 1967, as stated in uh, this paragraph, which I cited from uh, uh, British archive. So uh, if that happened, uh, China's uh, the assumption of Hong Kong's sovereignty could have uh, brought forward to 1967. Uh, 
while um, uh, the while it's mainly uh, uh, triggered by the Cultural Revolution in China, uh, it is uh, undeniable that um, the mayhem in 1967, coupled with uh, the 1966 uh, Star of the Revolt, uh, did expose some deep-rooted problems in the colony. And uh, 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 many of them may not uh, uh, imagine that uh, there was no statutory holiday in 1960s. Uh, workers you, uh, need to work seven days a week. And uh, really a low paid holiday, and uh, the government's uh, spending on uh, education uh, uh, accounts for a low proportion uh, of government expenditure. And uh, um, the staff very well also underlie uh, grievances of young people who had low connection with the leftist camp. And uh, uh, let me uh, read out some several paragraphs uh, from this uh, decent uh, gentleman who was a uh, intern uh, at a regional magazine, Fast Eastern Economic Review. These youngsters are moved by high ideals, however uh, misconceived. They are angry as what they regard as an unhealthy community. Stanley Pearson offers clear evidence that some members of the community are not willing to live by bread alone. It was written by uh, Mr. Andrew Lee, uh, our first uh, uh, CJ, uh, for uh, Far Eastern Economic Review in July 1968. And uh, he wrote it after meeting uh, a left-wing young prisoner, uh, Zhang Taksing, who later became uh, chief editor of uh, uh, for Beijing Tai Kung Pao, and uh, uh, later on became a secretary for Home Affairs. And uh, um, uh, my view is um, uh, it was uh, maybe too simple to um, conclude that um, um, the 1967 violence uh, 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 directly triggered uh, the social reform in Hong Kong. Um, uh, it could be uh, uh, understood in this way that it uh, served as a catalyst or critical events to force the colonial governments to do something. Uh, and uh, the momentum for reform uh, uh, had already in place in the middle of the 1960s. Uh, there was a uh, inter uh, course departmental working group uh, within Hong Kong government in 1966, which produced a report uh, which is, uh, puts forth some innovating ideas such as uh, mandatory property fund uh, and uh, sickness benefit uh, for workers, but it was self because of uh, uh, opposition uh, from business sector. Uh, sorry, maybe I'm running out of time. Maybe uh, let me conclude by uh, comparing, uh, doing a, a simple comparison between the two events. Uh, why I was uh, uh, thinking uh, what is happening now may have maybe overtaking what happened in 1967. You see the number of, of arrests uh, currently is already uh, approaching or over at this moment, over 7,000 7, people uh, in just seven months. Uh, meanwhile, uh, in 1967, uh, about uh, 4,500 people uh, were arrested. So uh, now the current government administration uh, has already uh, uh, done something which uh, uh, the colonial government uh, managed to do in, in eight months' time. Uh, the lesson uh, from uh, 1967s, uh, uh, which I have drawn, is uh, when uh, a social movement uh, uh, resorts to violent means uh, or extremist uh, methods, it could lose uh, public support. But I myself was also uh, partial uh, by uh, the consistent uh, 
and relatively high support uh, for the ongoing protests in Hong Kong despite uh, uh, the often violent uh, protests. Uh, I can only uh, uh, come to this uh, observation that uh, probably because of uh, uh, the majority of Hong Kong people uh, still uh, remain uh, sympathetic with uh, the protesters uh, currently uh, because the Hong Kong government is uh, 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 doing worse. Uh, maybe uh, let me finish here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Zheng. Uh, this historical um, historical account of what happened, as you can uh, see, is actually very useful for, for comparison. Uh, and actually, uh, I remember that uh, two two years ago in two o. Uh, 2017, uh, there are some documentaries and, uh, and conferences on the 50th anniversary of the 1967 riots. So at that time, we, we, we couldn't imagine that uh, something similar, uh, some, some kind of rioting similar could have happened again, but actually it happened. That shows that the study of history is, is uh, really uh, important. Um, so now... Um, May I now move to our second speaker, uh, Professor John Wong, Associate Professor in the School of Modern Languages and Cultures in our university. Uh, he, he is actually the co-editor, together with my colleague Michael Ng, of a book uh, on civil unrest and governance in Hong Kong, law and order from historical and cultural perspectives. Um, which was published by Routledge in 2017. Uh, that book considers the various important social movements in Hong Kong uh, from the perspective of historical and cultural studies. So uh, actually some of the speakers today uh, were contributors to that book, uh, including Mr. Gary Zhang and, um, and also Professor Agnes Ku. Um, and in fact, I myself also contributed a chapter to the book. So now may I invite uh, Dr. Wong to speak to us. Thank you, Albert. And thank you all for joining us uh, early on this, what day is today, Tuesday morning, to talk about an issue that is obviously pressing to this very city. Now, as a historian, um, I'm not supposed to be presentist. As a matter of fact, I should help everyone guard against being presentist. So what I propose to do is to explore the shifting narrative, the debates, um, that developed into contemporary discourse of um, discontent and conflict that we see in um, today's Hong Kong. Um, in looking into history, history of Hong Kong's recent past, hopefully we can find some, uh, some clues as to how we can resolve the current crisis. Now let's start with the present. Um, this is something that no one would be unfamiliar with. Um, this is basically the anthem of the protest. And what you can see here loud and clear would be demands for democracy and freedom. Ideals that are supposed to be universal and timeless. What I'm trying to do as we stretch back in time um, to bridge where we are now uh, from the 60s, which Gary started out with, into the umbrella movement and to the present day is to see if we can focus on um, some of the trends that unfolded after Gary's period into the present and what I'll emphasize is the social economic mobility um, as a means by which the colonial government and actually the early SAR government um, derived this legitimacy to govern and to rule Hong Kong. What I would try to help us understand is to go beyond the protesters' political demands and explore the socioeconomic forces that might have fueled today's movement. And in doing so, I want to explore how the colonial government actually structured a narrative um, around what Gary actually left us with, which is the social and economic reform of the 70s and beyond, and how these factors actually unraveled into the recent years and causing the problems that we see today. Now a disclaimer, 
Then I explore socioeconomic forces underpinning the discontent of Hong Kongers today does not deny the legitimacy of our political or their political demands. The political demands in the current turmoil underscore the erosion of Hong Kongers' faith in the administration and the mounting unease in the Hong Kong-Beijing relationship. What I explore then is but the material dimension of that deteriorating relationship. So going to the, the riots, um, Gary explained to us in very insightful and uh, comprehensive details, what I find interesting is how the colonial government actually regained this footing um, and in the aftermath of these riots. And as a matter of fact, you know, how the previous generation of Hong Kongers actually acquiesced to the rule of the colonial government after the late 60s uh, development. <clears throat> in a way, it's actually, uh, it's, in no way is this an attempt to say that Hong Kong did not enjoy democracy in the 80s and we, we do not deserve it now, but how the, gov how the British colonial government actually constructed the narrative in a bid to secure its regime, especially against the uh, global forces at work at that time. Now, a couple of things I would like to highlight from um, Gary's uh, presentation is that the British actually thought that they would need to leave the city, so much so that there was an emergency evacuation plan that did not have to come to pass. And what's equally interesting was how the left wing in Hong Kong suffered a heavy defeat because of the image that they, um, they developed, a tarnished image because of the bomb attacks. So we know the aftermath of, of the 66, uh, 67 riots. We had a whole series of reform, um, education, um, television broadcasting, the 10-year housing program, which in 1972, the government initiated and promised to house 1.8 million people within eight years. Um, that was uh, against a census data of 4 million population at that time, so it was a significant number. So the ironic product of the 1967 disturbance was the enhanced legitimacy and recognition for the British colonial government in Hong Kong. And I want to understand why. I suggest that we need to appreciate that in the context of the Cold War battle. It was a juxtaposition of the chaos in China and the resumed stability in Hong Kong. The chaos might have been uh, mainland inspired if not orchestrated, but it was actually the stability that people appreciated in the 70s and in, in their minds thanks to the British colonial government. As a business historian, economic historian, you know, I, I, I would like to appreciate it more in quantifiable details. And what I present here for you is the GDP growth of Hong Kong and the period that we're exploring. Outrageous, phenomenal growth. Now we worry whether our engine for the world's economy, China, is going to maintain a 6% growth. Look at the growth rate in Hong Kong. In excess of 10%, 20%, sometimes even 30%. Now there were some rough years as well, but quite consistently high uh, percentages in terms of year-to-year -year growth. Now for those of you who, who have lived through this period like I did, you will say, yeah, John, you're kidding me. There was uh, high inflation as well. But even if you would adjust for the, the uh, inflation of that period, real GD, GDP growth often exceeded 5% in that period, outrageously high, even by today's standards. So what's the narrative? Why am I showing you a picture of the fireworks that we didn't have and will not have again um, <laughs> this, this Sunday? Does anyone know the, uh, when, when this tradition of fireworks was invented in Hong Kong? It was actually in 1980s, 1982, allegedly to celebrate the 150th anniversary of J.D. Matheson. So this is quite a different type of fireworks compared to what we've seen in the recent past. And what type of narrative were they constructing? Well, you will see here, this is an orchestrated effort by the government, corporations, and the media to showcase before we asked for democracy and freedom, there was another slogan. Anyone care to suggest that? Well, if you know it, you, you show your age. Um, you'll be in my age group. Prosperity and stability. <laughs> one thing, fine wing, fine wing, one thing. Um, uh, that, that, that was all the rage um, in that period. How should we appreciate that? Well, this whole slogan, narrative, um, jargon of that period, 
did not quite uh, develop in that particular period. They certainly had their um, origins farther back. But you can see here uh, in these three clippings uh, that we can quickly go through, um, it started even when Trench was leaving Hong Kong. Uh, that was what Macri Holtz actually touted when he arrived at Hong Kong. And of course, that was what um, the, the Chinese and the British side both um, advertised quite heavily in the late 70s when talks over the future of Hong Kong um, came into full gear. Remember, it was an age of decolonization when things started you know, in the, in the 60s, um, when Hong Kong was in turmoil, and the government needed to justify its power. And so this is actually not not a bad thing to advertise. When you cannot give people votes, at least you can give people good likelihood and stability in life, when the option across uh, the border in the north uh, was quite the opposite. So what I've decided to do is, well, we have all these uh, new newspaper advertisements, headlines uh, for, for these key terms. And so I went to the databases to track um, the development over time and, and to tally the development over time. And I focus on a few newspapers in particular, just so that we can zoom in um, on, the, on, the, on the tallies. And to be comprehensive, I chose a you know, very pro-Beijing newspaper and a newspaper that's more pro-Taiwan, pro-business. So looking at this, it's no surprise. Both of these Chinese newspapers registered an uptick in the references to prosperity and stability right around the riots of the 60s. It became a little bit more quiet in the 70s, and it spiked in the 80s, right around the talks over the future of Hong Kong, and actually even in the years after. A big English newspaper in Hong Kong, South China Morning Post, similar. Not quite as pronounced an uptick in the 60s, but certainly the huge spike in the 80s, around the same period that we witnessed the uh, uh, the uptick in the Chinese newspapers. So why am I calling it a narrative? Well, Hong Kong was going through a period of economic expansion and socially it was certainly becoming uh, a little bit uh, more of a livable city. But how should we one how should we read such frequency charts? Uh, Actually, I lived through that period, and I, the, the example that I would like to remind our students of um, is, remember the Clean Hong Kong campaign? Many of my undergrads uh, love to tell me, oh, well, th there was the Clean Hong Kong campaign. That's evidence that Hong Kong was very clean at that time. <laughs> well, you, you, are the, you are the informed crowd, so you would know it's quite the opposite, and uh, we, can, we, can, we can recall how we did not want to be uh, well, well, how he did not want to look like Lao Tzu Chong, the, the green monster that was a garbage guy. So to appreciate how to um, uh, how people actually experience this uh, allegedly period of prosperity and stability, I suggest that we go to the Hang Seng Index. That was how that was how people experienced it. I think you can read it in reverse to see how people were actually having a hopeful future economically or socially in Hong Kong. You can see a dip, right, um, when, when the uh, references to prosperity and stability uh, registered the uptake. But then it quickly rebounded in the 80s, in the, in the mid 80s, when the situation subsided. So, what's, what's this thing with the new discourse, um, with uh, freedom and democracy? When did it first arrive in Hong Kong then? Well, of course, this is not something that is invented here, uh, but people were looking for it, even in the 80s. Uh, in conjunction with prosperity and stability. The turning point, though, was 1989, when the future of Hong Kong was decided. We knew in eight short years it would revert, re revert to Chinese sovereignty. But then we saw what happened on June 4th. Millions of Hong Kongers took to the streets. And in the aftermath of that, we arrived at basic law, which, if you can look at this uh, newspaper clipping of 1992, was to guarantee us, obviously, freedom, but also democracy, stability, and prosperity. So this new concern, if I were to go back to the same newspapers, you can see how it registered um, pretty high tallies early on uh, in, the, in the Chinese newspapers during the period of decolonization, um, the 50s and the 60s. But then the uptick did not quite show up in the 80s until the late 80s of the period that we're talking about. Of course, we have to remember, 
all that happened in 1990, 1989 was not just Tiananmen. It was also a period of global agitation, and part of that is reflected in the, in the clippings that we have here. Similar with the South China Morning Post. The huge uptick was in the late 80s, right around that period. Can we have it all? Well, this is from 1991. Uh, there was the faith in democracy. What changed was the arrival of our last governor, who wisely bundled liberty or, or freedom with prosperity and stability upon his arrival. They quickly stimulated a lot of debates about how compatible these issues are, um, and even cartoons of this, uh, this uh, cartoon character uh, wielding uh, the, the bat of uh, prosperity and stability um, against, I guess, the um, a mock version of the Statue of Liberty. Interestingly, as we know, Hong Kong did go through a period of successful transition um, in around 1997. And if you were to look at the narrative versus new concerns, you can see that prosperity and stability actually ranked higher than freedom and democracy, at least into the 90s. This is South China Morning Post. This is the edition of the two Chinese newspapers I talked about. So then came the umbrella movement. What I would put forth for your suggestion is that that old narrative did not quite fit the bill anymore, at least for certain parts of the population. People may not have been um, feeling prosperous or stable anymore in Hong Kong. Dial forward the same chart that I showed you. There's a marked decline in the GDP growth rate. We took it down quite a few notches. To make it worse, it's becoming more of a disparity of the rich and the poor. Medium monthly income, basically flattened, plateaued. All at the same time, when real estate prices skyrocketed. Now, I think for those of you who are who are who are um, paying attention to details, you will say, "John, you showed us a stock chart. Why are you showing us a real estate price chart now?" Well, that's because if you were to look at the components of um, our Hang Seng Index, you see some drastic changes in the composition. You can notice that I've I've labeled some yellow, uh, some white, some red. The red are the red stocks. In 1998, one. By 2008, only HSBC is holding on to the top 10 of our Hang Seng components and has dropped further in the ranking in the recent years. So if the reason I propose that we look at the real estate index for this later period is it's not just an index. It is the lived experience of the people. If you were to look at um, you know, some of the uh, leading indi indicators, like um, Mei Fu, which was uh, the, 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 um, the iconic middle class development in Hong Kong, or Tai Kusheng. When you have prices going from 5,000 per square foot to you know, close to 20, as income was flat, you can see how that would uh, drive people's perception of how a narrative works or not. I'm not a cultural historian, but I happen to be working with uh, a student on the protest songs, and I've noticed the same thing. It started with The Lion Rock, which is very much um, a song about the trials and tribulations of that particular era, how Hong Kong then developed into an economic miracle. And then we moved on to the Beyond Song, which does talk about freedom. But look, note, this is asking for forgiveness because I am actually a man of freedom, a person of freedom. And the contestation over the Lion Rock development until this anthem that appeared a few months ago. And of course, iconically, you have uh, they kept recaptured the Lion Rock as well. But what I want to um, suggest for our consideration is what, what should, should we ignore economic conditions when we are staging our political demands? I, I would suggest that economic factors are necessary but not sufficient. What can the Hong Kong government do right now? Of course, you cannot replicate history. You cannot just put all the ingredients in there, shake, in there, shake, 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 and then out come another golden era of Hong Kong. But then we should appreciate that, ironically, slogans that we consider timeless and universal may have different currency. 
while Hong Kong is fighting for democracy and freedom, maybe prosperity and stability ring true, more true, to mainland China, which was experiencing the same type of economic takeoff that Hong Kong experienced in the 70s and the 80s. Now, in the spirit of the Chinese New Year, uh, actually, I'll, I'll skip uh, a few of these slides in the interest of time, but it shows you, the dialing forward, um, the, the register of um, the endurance of uh, prosperity and stability in um, the media. But who are these people who are still talking about uh, prosperity and stability? Well, you have the uh, mainland Chinese army, you have our, uh, our chief executive, Xi Jinping, and it's not just politicians. Li Kaxing said that as well. So if you were to think through what is going on in the minds of the protesters, maybe prosperity and stability actually still has a certain rationale to them. They're not feeling prosperous. They're not quite seeing the social mobility and economic mobility that we experienced in a previous generation. So if you don't, get, if you don't give me prosperity, you don't get a stability either. Hence, they, if, we, if we burn, you burn with us. We have to reconsider what the one country, two systems proposition is, whether it's truly economic or, or political in nature. After all, Deng Xiaoping promised us that we still have horse racing and dancing. He didn't promise us a vote. <laughs> and in the spirit of the Chinese New Year that's coming up, let me leave you with some good fortunes. Um, people are becoming so creative um, in, in um, Protest. This is a, this is a sign that we all recognize. Xiu Chao Junbo, a petition for or wishing you uh, prosperity and wealth in the coming year. <laughs> Flip it upside down. It's a pursuit for democracy and freedom. Now, have we really turned the world upside down? Is the world really upside down? Are these demands actually diametrically opposed? Are they two sides of the same coin? I know that, uh, we know that an old narrative doesn't seem to fit the bill anymore, and the next narrative doesn't seem to get universal acceptance. I hope we can continue this, this discussion and figure out what will work for Hong Kong in the years to come. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Wong. Uh, this, um, this is also a historical uh, uh, presentation, but uh, as you can see, um, uh, it brings us up to date uh, uh, from the 1960s all the way up to the present. And, uh, and we are reminded of uh, the, the, the narratives of, uh, this, of uh, prosperity and stability, as well as the more recent uh, narrative of democracy and the freedom. So may we now move to the uh, third uh, speaker, uh, Professor Pang Lai Guan, uh, who is a professor at the Department of Cultural and uh, Religious, Religious Studies at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Um, professor Pang's latest book uh, is called The Appearing Demos, published by University of Michigan Press this year. And the book uh, is concerned with the recent dissident movements in Hong Kong from both uh, a global perspective and a cultural perspective. So um, we're very glad, glad that Professor Pang will speak, us, speak to us today. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Professor Yap uh, in bringing me here. Um, I, he knows that I have um, a book coming up, and then he asked me to talk about it. So here I am. I'm only at 20 minutes, so I'm going to separate my uh, lecture, I mean, speech in two parts. In the first part, I hope to just introduce you two basic concepts I'm try I was trying to develop in my book that form of, that form kind of like a theoretical you know, foundation of the book. And then in the second half, I will dwell on one chapter that was in uh, chapter eight, I think, um, that uh, investigates specifically the rule of law and its implications in today's Hong Kong situations. Um, so let's start. Um, that's my book. And then just for, to remind you, um, I guess none of you need to be reminded, but part of my um, duty here is to um, go back 
to the umbrella movement. So very quickly, the period, we all remember 2014 started September 28 to December 15, it lasted 79 days. Locations at Mutsi, uh, Mong Kong, Causeway Bay, for those of you who remember, there was actually two other spaces being occupied, which was uh, Wan Zai and Jim Sa Jui, but it was very short and they um, folded very quickly. The demand was only one, universal suffrage in Hong Kong primarily. We know that this demand was later incorporated into one of the five demands today, so there is clearly a continuation of the umbrella movement and today's anti lot movement. Organizers, um, Occupy Central with Love and Peace, Wobbing Tim Jong, Hong Kong Federation of Students, Hock Lun, and Scholarism, Hock Mun. Uh, it's very sad because most, um, we know that pretty much um, all the three organizers have uh, people, so to speak, leaders being um, uh, criminal, I mean, uh, uh, convicted, and now some of them are still in law, so uh, in, in, in the prison. So we know that this is, um, in a way, demonstrate the kind of like tragedy. Um, this event has been unfolding. So what I would like to do now is to introduce two concepts here that I was trying to theorize in my book. When I was writing my book, one of the things I kept keeping myself is to uh, make sure that to convince the people, not just the Hong Kong people, but the um, other people in other parts of the world, my readers, the significance of uh, Hong Kong's event, not just in terms of the local situation, but what does the Hong Kong event tell to the outside world? One of the things that I find, uh, I, think, I think it's very important is to come back to uh, confront the idea of sovereignty. We all know that sovereignty is one of the most important concepts in today's uh, world order because it really constitutes how a nation state position itself, both outside, I mean, its diplomatic relationships, and inside, towards the people and the territory. And we know that sovereignty has been a particular, I think, a troublesome and problematic concept, not just in China, China definitely, but in many other parts of the world, in the sense that it has been appropriated by the nation states to become the power or the source of legitimacy to um, sort of like uh, order or represents the people. So there's a very complicated relation between sovereignty and democracy here, because sovereignty seems to be legitimized by some kind of democracy within the nation state, you know, various degrees. We can also argue that PRC is a democratic country. It's really up to you to, to argue. But at the same time, the idea of sovereignty get to be replacing or uh, consuming of the power of the democracy in order to articulate the power or the legitimacy of the sovereignty so that it can tell the people what is right and what is what representing the entire people to every individual person. So we know that that has been a major problem, not just in this part of the world, but many other parts of the world. A lot of problems that arise we are seeing in different in Europe, in the United States, have been somehow related to our uh, the way that the nations they operate through the idea of sovereignty. So I think the, um, the Hong Kong event, not just the umbrella movement, but continuing nowadays, has been a very important lesson towards the world is the meaning of um, first the city, how to differentiate, uh, separate, that's the reason why I put the sovereignty in plurality, is to how are we able to conceptualize some kind of sovereignty or democracy in a multiple sense. And I do think that the one country, two system has that inbuilt uh, tensions or dynamics to uh, allow us to think sovereignty in a multiple sense and allow us to think about the place where democracy can take place. It could take place in a city like Hong Kong. Hong Kong might be special, but if somehow we can have different, that kind of multiple uh, sovereignties taking place in, a Ch in China and Hong Kong, this model can actually be applied, not necessarily applied, but appropriated in many other places to solve a lot of problems, particularly in terms of the site of importance, uh, political importance as a city. How can we imagine a city where democracy takes place, which can bypass some kind of national sovereignty. So I think what Hong Kong is doing has, I mean, I still, am, I still am convinced that it has global um, political 
uh, significance in that sense. And so, um, and then this kind of city-based um, sovereignty, or minor sovereignty, however you want to say it, um, can actually allow us to conceptualize democracy based on living communities instead of permanent power, instead of permanent state it has to go back to you know, 5,000 5, years of history and that so on and so forth. Let's talk about the actual site where democracy takes place in order to understand how political structure could be uh, conceptualized. So in a way, what we can do, tell the people if our project succeed, is to conceptualize the uh, mechanism to really divide sovereignty and denationalize democracy. That's my first theoretical concept um, um, underground my work. And the other concept that was more particularly related to the Occupy event, because um, earlier I talked about um, multiple sovereignty. You, I mean, in the book, I tried very hard to differentiate the protest in two different dimensions. The protest as a sign. That means that protest is trying to deliver a message to a Hong Kong situation that was specifically the, um, uh, the request or demand for genuine democracy or uh, 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 universal suffrage. That is the message. But there is also another aspect of the protest. It's protest as process. What about the form? What about the actual um, operation? The process, I think, is precisely another concept um, I try to develop in the, in the book is the cohabitation. That has to be uh, grounded in, again, a global you know, situation, a global context, which is the global occupied movement. Uh, obviously, occupation took place many for many years. Um, we can also go back to the uh, earliest, uh, not earliest, but uh, recently, the civil movement in the, in the 60s in many parts of the world. But let's say the global, I mean, the occupied movement, the contemporary uh, global occupied movement took place within the last 10 years, around, um, started in 19, my tw uh, 2010s, um, started with the Arab Spring, and then it moved on um, in from Tunisia to Egypt, and then Turkey and Spain, and, uh, um, and then later on, Occupy Wall Street, as well as uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong. So in a way, Hong Kong sort of like, if we put it back to a particular historical sense, um, a global history sense, uh, Hong Kong actually occupied almost like a climax of this Occupy movement, global Occupy movement, because after Hong Kong, that form of Occupy sort of like died down. There's still some going on, but not as spectacular as it was. From 2011 to 2014, there was a mere short three or four years, and it uh, went through the entire world. And why I think it is important as to emphasize not just protest as sign, but also protest as process, is because Occupy itself is a process. It's about strangers coming together, leaving their own private domestic place, and come and live together um, in a public space, changing the public space, and reinforcing or giving new meanings to the place. And one of the reasons why I want to um, uh, emphasize the cohabitation is to precisely to demonstrate a particular human condition, which is we cannot choose our neighbors. There, is, there isn't such a thing called right to your neighbors. You cannot choose whom you want to live with. There are people around you you hate. Unfortunately, you cannot ask them to go. You could, you can leave. Ultimately, you will be moving to another place, seeing another neighbors you hate. This is a part of your human conditions that we have to acknowledge, that we just have to live with strangers. We, live, we are not only living with friends and family members. We also live with other people. That's not my concept. It's actually um, uh, Hannah Rand's concept. Um, if I have time, I will go talk more about it. And so this is also one of the main conditions of democracy. Democracy meaning that we have to come to terms with strangers. Um, you, you like, I mean, we might belong to the same political community, but we are not. Be, we do. We are not. This, we do not belong to the same. This, let's say, domestic family or extended family. But these are the people we need to treat them as equal. We can, we have to build a community and a society with them politically, 
So that's the, in a way, I think one of the conditions of democracy is precisely cohabitation. And most importantly, these members have to be autonomous individuals, as shown in the Occupy movement, and they also develop some kind of intersubjectivity, meaning that we do not just go out and assert our rights and say, this is what I want, this is my interest, this is my right. But I also need to talk to them, discuss with them, understanding them, and develop some kind of intersubjectivity together. So now I would like to go to uh, the second part. Um, we all know uh, Professor Dai, I'm putting here, here partly to um, pay tribute, but we know that the Occupy movement is based on a, a concept that is called civil disobedience. A lot of you know more than I do, but I'll try to um, um, invite you to you know, think with me how to understand civil disobedience here. We do know that there is a right to assembly that's part of the Universal uh, Human Rights Declaration, but there is never a right to occupy. There's no such thing. So the entire Occupy movement is based on the concept <laughs> of civil disobedience. But we also know that around the world there is um, there might be, you know, legal regimes that acknowledge there are actually many uh, acknowledging civil disobedience, but the two main conditions is nonviolence and inflicting no harms on others. And unfortunately, most of them would say all the occupied movement do not pass this test. Either they are pretty violent, like in Egypt or in, in, in Turkey, or they inflict a lot of harm on others. I mean, in Hong Kong, it creates so much inconvenience. So uh, a lot of time when we put this kind of uh, civil disobedience as a, um, as a base in front of the court, they were not recognized based on this. But I would just like to very quickly um, come back. We, this is something we all know, that if we want to understand the rule of law, we also need to understand not just a particular event, effect on the rule of law, but also understand the basic background and the political economy where the rule of law is situated. In Hong Kong, we know there's definitely the state one of the most problematic and you know, the, the, pro, um, the source of pro, uh, problem came from the fact that it was the PRC's, um, you can say, manipulation and or ultimately the ownership of Hong Kong's rule of law. Because we know that the, um, the PRC has repeatedly emphasized that it was the NPC, not the Hong Kong Legislative Council or the final court, but the NPC which has the ultimate jurisdictions over Hong Kong, and then there's also administrative you know, practices, uh, this disqualifying political decisions from uh, Hong Kong's lawmakers, so on and so forth. And then there's another thing that is largely ignored in Hong Kong, but it's actually even more important, which is neoliberalism, because we know that Hong Kong's rule of law is increased, or the legal system is increasingly subject to, to neoliberalism, which emphasized uh, deregulation and, de uh, and liberalization. So these are two, you can say, different forces underlying our understanding of or our operations of Hong Kong's rule of law. So the question is, I think, not just to the Occupy movement, but also to today. I mean, today is much more complicated, even more complicated, because no one would say this is, um, you know, vandalism is a civil disobedience anymore. It just doesn't work anymore. But ultimately, people are still using that kind of mentality, even not using the terms, except term. But we need to understand the relations between what's going on on the street and what's, you know, we are discussing uh, in, in, in a, let's say, in a faculty of law kind of a, um, environment. As to what extent um, obedience and disobedience to the law, to society, to politics, can, should be understood. So the first and foremost important ground, I think we have to understand every, most of these um, issues. A democracy. Obviously, I'm not so interested in sovereignty. Of course, if you're talking to the PRC officers, they would throw you sovereignty immediately. But let's say we talk. Let's talk about democracy first. What I'm trying to say that if we are the people who write the laws, who should also have the ability to continue rewrite the law, in that sense that we should have the ability to say no to our political body, as well as to say no to the laws that we write ourselves. And uh, we can read it from the other perspective. 
law, modern law, actually is already equipped with the ability to constantly reinvent itself. It's not just not there to be obeyed or disobeyed. We are talking about a wrong kind of like relationship. We write the law, and we have the, as the citizens, okay, uh, within a democratic cons uh, environment, we have the ability to rewrite it, and we are asked to rewrite it. Um, so I'm here to uh, give you a quote. Uh, again, my book was uh, underlined very heavily by Aran's uh, political theory. So in that particular chapter, I also refer to her a lot. Let's say what she writes here. Every man is born a man, okay, saying, I mean, problem, huh? but that's fine. Um, she is written in 1972. Um, every man is born into a community with pre-existing laws, which he obeys, first and all, because there's no other way for him to enter the great game of the world. I may wish to change the rules of the game, as the revolutionary does, or to make an exception for myself, as the criminal does, but to deny them on principle means no mere disobedience, but the refusal to enter the human community. Okay, we got it. We are born into a legal community. There's no other way than to play along with the game. That's the situation. We all have to acknowledge. You, you cannot just say, I disobey it. It's just not possible if you want to become a part of the political community. But it doesn't mean that. That's the end of the discussions. Uh, we know that um, one of the main, uh, most important concepts that Arantz developed was the banality of evilness. That was developed also through a trial case. Uh, we know that his book, I mean, her book was developed out of a 1962 trial of uh, Adolf Eichmann in Jerusalem, where we know that Eichmann was the person who facilitated, I mean, German officers, facilitated logistics involved in the mass deportation of Jews to the extermination camp uh, in the 1940s. And he is a law-abiding citizen, as he confessed to uh, the people, and he's, he defend himself by saying that he simply followed others. He was doing what his senior asked him to do. So what he was doing, is he has no responsibility to what he does, even though he was the person who actually responsible for shifting a lot of Jews to the concentration, concentration camp, and he knew that that was it that, that would kill them, that would uh, lead them to the um, tragic end. But he said that I was not responsible for it because of defending himself because I was simply following an order. And then Aran was there throughout the whole period and what he said, what she said was that this precisely shows, it was his obedience that precisely shows the banality of evilness because he follows others. He follows the, the rules, as I mentioned earlier that in a way she understands that we all are born into a particular political environment, a legal environment. We have no other way than to obey them. But at the same time, if we simply obey them, like I can do, that was the most profound human evilness that he, she was, um, one of the most profound human evilness she discovered, which is the banality. It's how evilness can be so banal, because by simply following the rules, instead of creating a certain critical distance and ask myself, obviously she was uh, uh, quoting uh, Kant and so on and so forth, which we do not have time to go into too much of detail. But what, he was trying, what she was trying to invite us to think is to how to avoid uncritical obedience to the law while respecting the law as the foundation of our political community. And um, I think it's from her, I re I, we all learned that it's the duty of the citizens to live, to reflect, and challenge the law at the same time. I was going to uh, give you some examples of an artist who was uh, Luke Cheng, who had the artwork um, in 2018 Guangzhou Biennale. What she was do he was doing is precisely to commit the law, I mean, even commit the crime in outside the territory in order to uh, challenge some of the things, but I'm running out of time, I understand, so I'll just leave it here. If we have the, if you're interested, we can talk more, but let me stop it here. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pang, uh, for the 
introducing us the, the cultural studies perspective uh, in looking at the Occupy Central movement, which which I think is also very relevant to the understanding of the current uh, current anti expedition movement uh, as well. May we now move to the uh, fourth speaker, uh, Professor Lei Zhengguan from uh, the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, where she is chair professor at the Division of Social Sciences. Um, she has published uh, a number of books on China, uh, which are uh, award-winning books. And her most recent work is a co-edited volume on the umbrella movement called um, Take Back Our Future, an eventful sociology of the Hong Kong umbrella movement, uh, which was published last year by Cornell University Press. So we are also very glad that Professor Lee can address us today. Can I speak from my yeah. chair? Yes, please. Thank you. Because I don't have a PowerPoint. Um, Thank you very much, Professor Chen. And I want to uh, particularly thank Professor Yap, who kindly has invited me to share the stage with so many uh, experts on Hong Kong history, culture, uh, society, and politics. Some of you may know I have been away uh, from Hong Kong for more than 20 years. And um, so I'm just trying to pick up some of the things I've missed while I was looking elsewhere in Africa and China. And, um, and um, at the beginning, I think Professor Yap want, wanted me to talk about um, this book, which Professor Chen just mentioned. And uh, my co-editor, Sing Ming, is here in the audience. Um, it's about the umbrella movement. But um, I have a very bad habit of not wanting to talk about my books once they're out. <laughs> I almost feel like I'm embarrassed and that these are kids, you know, you let them grow, they have their lives of, uh, lives of their own once you're finished. And so um, as a compromise, uh, we decided that I should, actually I wanted to talk about the current movement which I've been studying for the past seven months, um, but as a compromise and also as a bridge uh, be between these two sections of the panel, I, I think uh, I can talk about the similarity, the difference, and also the connection uh, between these two movements that I don't think I need to go into any detail. And, um, and so I'll just share some uh, broad arguments and, and perspectives. Um, and uh, one idea that I like to propose for all of us who are interested in Hong Kong sociology, political science, or culture, uh, that runs through all my comments. And that is the idea of eventful sociology, which is in the subtitle of the book, or the idea of events. So, and you, you'll understand what I'm trying to get at once, you, once I'm done. Um, so the, talk, the comments that I'm offering here consist of three parts. One is about similarity between the two movements, the difference, and also the connection. So these two movements, there are many similarities, and I like just to highlight what I think is the most important one and most perhaps theoretically uh, significant. Um, it is that both movements are shocking events. They shock us um, and the world, they shock Beijing, uh, they shock the Hong Kong government, and also, most of all, they shock us ourselves, people in Hong Kong who participate in these two movements. And um, in this book, in the introduction, I proposed the idea that we should think of these protests as eventful protests. Um, the term eventful is not just a description of the colorful, dramatic, um, manifold kind of practices, different types of practices that happen during this protest. Eventful is actually a theoretical construct and approach. So what are events? Events are not just any incidents. Events are rare. They're spontaneous, they're unpredictable happenings that instead of being produced by structure as 
we social scientists are trained to think and assume social structure, political structure, economic structure produce events, produce what we do, our behavior. The term event and the perspective of eventful uh, sociology suggests that there are events, there are happenings, there are practices that instead of being produced by structure are disruptive of structure. They redirect the impact of structure. And so it reverses, it helps us to think in reverse order in terms of causal priority. And in these two protest movements, you could see, we have seen that as events, as sudden explosions of human creativity and concentrated energy, they actually can defy and have defied structural and institutional constraints. And that's why we never expect them to happen. We have never expected that Occupy would last so long, and we never have expected in June that this movement has lasted for as long as it has. And I think this is important idea. This is an important idea, important perspective to bear in mind when we think about Hong Kong politics, particularly political sociology, the interaction between government and society. Because there are other instances where we could describe Hong Kong movements, political movements here, as eventful. Um, some of my fellow speakers mentioned 1989. Nobody expected to turn out of more than a million uh, on June 4th. And then 2003, nobody expected half a million people came out in protest. And then, of course, 2014, 2019. And nobody expected them because in ordinary times, Hong Kong people are not known to be politi political. They are known to be the opposite, a apolitical, apathetic to political activism. People don't want to participate in civil society organizations. But then, in extraordinary times, over and over again, Hong Kong society has manifested and demonstrated this creative, concentrated creativity, concentrated energy. That is exactly what the idea of events or eventual protest is about. So I'm proposing that given all these instances, we should at least use in our repertoire of concepts to understand political sociology of Hong Kong that in addition to the existing ones that have been you know, proposed by very famous scholars, starting with S.K. Lau, the structural perspective, um, and then Mao, institutional perspective, and other people talking about enduring cultural predisposition of the you know, apolitical Hong Kong culture, we should add this kind, add event or eventual sociologies as a kind of um, important tool uh, in our toolkit to think and understand about Hong Kong politics because Hong Kong politics do have two faces or Hong Kong's mo po uh, political movements, do political life does have two faces. Ordinary times, we don't care. We're very quiet, acquiescent, apolitical. But in extraordinary times, people are passionate about politics, about justice. They come out in large numbers. So I think both are real. We don't have to choose actually the duality of ap apathy and politicization is exactly what is so uniquely interesting about Hong Kong uh, political life and, about, and, and why we have always been shocked by what we do because our concept, the toolkits we have, does not allow us to hold these two opposite in the same plane of view. And I think given these two movements we have and the similarity they share with other historical events that we should from now on think in terms of, yes, institution and structure and culture, but also the opposite of these, which is the idea of event and eventful sociology. So that's my first point about similarity. About difference, I think there's a major difference between uh, umbrella and 2019, the anti-extradition movement. In terms of its nature, or the nature of resistance, in terms particularly of its political orientation, 
I think, as I argued in this book, the umbrella movement was a reformist movement. It was actually very conservative in its goal because what it wanted to do, the demands, universal suffrage, it was a constitutional reform of the election system. We didn't challenge anything, come to think about it. It's just asking Beijing to realize what was written down in the basic law, universal suffrage. 2019, as I begin to be convinced more and more these days, as I study more and more of it, as it develops uh, in, 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 um, in front of us, is that it, it is turning out to be a revolutionary movement. It demands, of course, constitutional reform. Universal suffrage is one of the five demands, but it goes much, much more beyond reforming the election system. It is actually raising fundamental questions about many core institutions of Hong Kong. We are questioning what is rule of law. We're questioning law and order. Because, and and you, you hear the demand to disband the police. And that is a very significant challenge to the status quo. We question the justice of law. We question what is lawful? What is rule of law? Do we still have rule of law? Is this, the court system still upholds rule of law? And we see violence, not just in the, on the street, but we see institutional violence. People are questioning seriously the legitimacy of the entire range of institutions. We question something unimaginable, I think, before this year, last year, market rationality. Can we, just, can we still believe that the mar market, competi competition in market, neutrality of the market? No, because we see politics in the market. Be people begin to see what Polanyi has said, that the market is embedded in politics, and they question whether we want to accept the current political embeddedness of our market. And that's why we people suggest that we should reconstruct our economy and we should have a yellow economic rim. We're also rethinking what unionism is and what the relation of unionism to us. We begin to believe in strikes and hope that strikes will be powerful. These are the beliefs that you will never think that Hong Kong would be subscribing to before this movement. But these are now on the agenda, on the table. And people are actually not just thinking about them. They're acting out their beliefs. They're trying to realize these not long ago unimaginable political economic ideas. Culture, a very fundamental change. We will reimagine what Hong Kong is as a community. Um, I, ca I can't go into the details, but many of the people I study in the front line, they told me before this movement, they hate Hong Kong, but now they're willing to die for it. <laughs> they hate Hong Kong because, like many of you, especially if you're not born here, for the first time you come to Hong Kong, you think Hong Kong people are selfish, they're rude. There's, they're opposite to community. And so, and also, um, diplomacy, post-national, I think people are trying different types of politics, which is very revolutionary to think about post-national politics, in a sense that Hong Kong activists are trying um, to, to do their own diplomatic connections, do their diplomatic um, uh, activism uh, beyond sovereignty. So I'll see how they approach the US, the UK, and other countries to advance legislations, uh, that protect our ways of life um, beyond this idea that we are bounded by the nation state and by Chinese sovereignty. My point here is that there has been a real radicalization between the umbrella and 2019. That's the difference. The difference is previously it was a reformist movement, but I think we are on the verge and we are beginning um, a revolutionary movement. 
That's the second point. The third point I want to make, and that's the last, is about the connection between these. They are different. These two movements are different in political orientation, but there are a lot of underlying connections. But these connections are dialectical in the sense that what happened in 2014 are connected to what happened now um, in a dialectical way, in a way that is not a direct extension of 2014 because, and again here the idea of event is very helpful, because people reflect on their mistakes, they learn, and they continue some of the good practices. The idea of event is that we should look inside the event to see what people are doing when the event happened. And so when you look into umbrella, you'll find all these practices about the Lenin War, the militants um, who tried the militancy but were sidelined and um, marginalized and condemned. But now, after reflection, people learn from mistakes in the past, and now they begin to see, most people begin to see the meaning and the usefulness of the practical political usefulness of militants. Um, and then all these uh, go back to the community, which is a very major slogan during Umbrella, and people did practice going back to the community, and that's why when 2019 rolled around, you can see decentralization propping up of all these localized activism behind those local practices were many of the community uh, groups that emerged after Umbrella and have been growing uh, quite quietly in the community. They are all coming back. So there are connections, and you will find these connections if you look inside these events. So today, when we are staying, studying this movement, we should look inside, pay attention to what, what is happening inside the movement, because they will continue into the next movement and beyond. And the event, the concept of event helps us to zero in on those practices during the movement, not what is outside or the preconditions, but exactly what people are doing. But event for sociology doesn't mean that structure no longer applies. No, structure is not oblig obliterated by events. Structure is redirected by events. And I think I, I have to highlight one uh, very important structural factor that we should all be aware of and use the eventful idea to understand that structural factor. And here I'm talking about the China factor. Behind these two movements that connects them and also propels the radicalization, of course, is China's internal colonization of Hong Kong that has, has picked up space, has become intensified for the past 10 years. And you see this radicalization of the movements developing in tandem with intensified internal colonization, and I, an argument that I developed in the introduction of this book. But it is important to think that China itself is part of another structure, the global political economy. And there are events in that political, in that structure that erupts unexpectedly. And no matter how China is powerful structurally, it will be disrupted. It will be dis in, it's being challenged and disrupted by events in that global system. Think about 2008 crisis. Think about the trade war now. Think about um, the anti-China feeling that is permeating um, much of the world. So what I'm suggesting here is that to understand our current situation, it is Im important and useful and productive instructive to talk, to think in terms of event. We have experienced two eventful protests in Hong Kong, taking place at an eventful moment in global political economy, where China is a part of. And what it suggests is that we are exploiting this eventful moment by our eventful protests. And I think there is a lot of uncertainty which may work in our advantage. And so the idea is to keep in mind um, there are these contingencies that are part of the structural picture that we have to um, analyze. And I want to emphasize that this is, um, this is a book that contains many, many chapters. I'm not, 
I haven't talked about this book uh, in my talk. Sorry, Professor Yap. Um, but um, it is a yellow book, both in content <laughs> and in appearance. So it's good to buy. <laughs> I don't think the Hong Kong Yulai uh, bookstore has it yet, but um, uh, you can order it from um, the website. Thank you. Um, thank you, Professor Lee, uh, for giving us a very um, rich uh, presentation uh, of many ideas and aspects, uh, including similarities, differences, and connection between the umbrella movement and the current uh, movement. Uh, by the way, I, I did see one copy of the book, uh, which is called uh, Take Back Our Future. Uh, uh, it's a yellow cover book uh, in the university bookstore recently. Um, but I think there are only one or two copies. So. <laughs> Uh, oh, oh, maybe the only copy. <laughs> uh, but the university bookstore is also five minutes walk from this building for those of you who want to visit it. Um, so um, we still have two more speakers. Uh, may I introduce to you the next speaker, Professor Agnes Koo, Associate Professor at the Division of Social Sciences at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, who uh, is also um, a contributor to the book which we have mentioned, uh, that edited by John Wong and Michael M on civil unrest and governance in Hong Kong. And uh, her uh, other, uh, other writings include uh, a, a book chapter on performing civil disobedience in Hong Kong and another on identity as politics. So may I now invite... Professor Ku to address us. Uh, thanks, Professor Yap, for inviting me to join this panel. Um, so I will talk about the current protests, and thanks, CK, for providing an excellent uh, bridge. Um, and I would like to uh, focus specifically on the issue of uh, youth participation, or what I call youth political agency. So, five years after the Umbrella Movement, in 2019, the Hong Kong people did come back, now with their five demands, including, of course, the demand for universal suffrage, and also the other four demands listed here. Now, if you ask, was it predominantly young people participating in the two spectacular protests? I would say yes. But there were also some differences. Let's look at some um, statistics. Now, here I use uh, the age of 29 as the cutoff, okay, and aggregate different data and drawing um, uh, survey data from uh, two different research studies. The data are not strictly comparable. One, um, they come from different studies with different research methodologies. Second, the current protest was exceptionally complex because it consists of um, a variety of events and episodes. Okay. So as you see, um, actually, um, they might be uh, selected from certain dates. Okay. But, but um, the, the numbers give us some ideas, roughly. As you can see, people aged 29 and below constituted around 60% of the movement participants in the umbrella movement. And that's a lot, right? More than half, yeah. And, and for the current protest, it would be 42%. It seems there's, there's a drop here, right? So you might be wondering, is it the case that we have less young people participating in the protests? Yes or no? I think the number could be misleading in one way. But if we compare the numbers with the general population, we'll see the larger picture. So it would be 28% okay, in the general population, which means that 
a few points that I want to uh, conclude from, from the numbers here before I move on. In the current protests, indeed, we have more generalized participation in society by people from different age cohorts, including older people, and also from different sectors, different classes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But just focusing on the issue of age. Still, the second point is participation was proportionally higher among younger people as compared to the general population. In other words, the first two points do not contradict each other. You see what I'm trying to get at? Okay, we do have predominantly younger people participating in the protests, but at the same time, we have you know, people from other age cohorts joining the protests in support of the students or you know, of the young people or in protest against the government, etc. Another point that I would like to bring up is that besides percentage, if we consider also absolute numbers, in this protest, we have more people participating, which means we also have more younger people participating in absolute numbers. Okay, so that's the scenario. And that, that sort of explains why I would like to focus on youth participation uh, without overlooking, of course, other age cohorts. Now, what's more, young people are not just active actors in the protests. They are also victims of violence of various kinds, putting them in very vulnerable situations, um, including you know, arrests, serious injuries, overseas escape, and also you know, uh, resulting in political suicides in some cases, and also mysterious deaths, etc., etc. So in what follows, I would like to highlight youth political agency with respect to subjectivity, strategy, and solidarity. And then I would consider the interaction among agency, context, and contingency. Subjectivity, by it, it means um, selfhood, consciousness, identity, and emotions, etc. I've previously written a paper on the umbrella movement. And what, what we have seen is that actually there has been um, the rise of a new political generation in recent years in Hong Kong with a new generational consciousness. I, will, I want, want to stress this idea of a new generational consciousness. It's not just a bunch of young actors, a new bunch of young, young people, but we have indeed a new generational consciousness. Say the post-90s generation and the millennials, they have been playing a very prominent role in some of the protests like the anti-national education campaign, the umbrella movement, and what also happened in the aftermath. In particular, these young people put forward during the umbrella movement a new discourse of self-mastery over one's identity, Ming Wan Zizhu, as a conscious break from the older discourse by the older generations, say, um, democratic unification. Okay. And by this, they stress autonomy, of course. They stressed agency. They stress a number of things. And this is why we see how a new discourse of localism has been developed afterwards or during the process. And I would say, some scholars have looked into this, right? The idea of localism actually spans a wide spectrum rather than representing just you know, a, a single brand of thoughts say from nativism to civic universalism. They are quite different strands of thought, but you know, understood under the umbrella term of localism. Another emphasis in the localist ideology is this idea of autonomy, of course, vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese government. Well, autonomy is a very sensitive issue, but it's not the same as independence. Arguably, right? But from what the group 
the Mosisto Zhongzi has been, you know, changing the discourse. We could see it. Now they have been advocating. They have changed the position in recent weeks, right? Over time, actually, from advocating self-determination that follows from the new discourse of self-mastery over one's destiny to the idea of progressive democracy. So you see.、Um, They don't want to conflate the ideas between autonomy and independence. No. So another recent study shows that actually the majority of people involved in the current protests did not take independence as the major protest motive. So that that was not the idea. Okay. Now two other elements are very prominent in the genera new generation of consciousness. One is the stress on agency. The young people, specifically. See agency in themselves, and they see agency in everyone, and not just in the leader, so to speak. And this entails a kind of decentering development, away from centralized leadership of any kind, towards what we are seeing a leaderless form of struggle. The other、um, element we're seeing. Is this process of radicalization leading to increased militancy? So I would like to dwell on this issue of militancy in in、uh, my presentation later. Another aspect、uh, about subjectivity concerns the role of emotions.、Um, I wouldn't want to dwell into the theoretical ideas behind it, but very briefly. I think it's very important, especially in the current protests. The intensity of emotions going with the protests, right? You see how people,、um, the the sense of despair, the sense of determination, the sense of suffering, and you know solidarity, and all these things really appeal to the hearts of many people, including older citizens, who therefore take to the street to support. The young people, right? Hence, we see you know、uh, groups like Protect Our Kids campaign, Hong Kong Mothers, right? And、um, for the young people, they are very determined because for them, it's a, like an end game in the fight for freedom, and also they don't see the future. And through all these emotions of suffering and solidarity, they come together, so they form a kind of community of common destiny, 命运共同体 So、uh, I think CK has also, you know, mentioned about of this, and all these things actually grew out of the lived experiences of the people during the protests. So emotions play a very important part in, you know, giving a boost to mobilization, and in also informing their sense of subjectivity, and also informing, you know, their strategy to some extent. Now let me then move on to strategy. I won't be able to talk about the connections among, you know. Uh, these different elements, but just want to highlight a few things. In terms of strategy, now what we say,、uh, emotions play a very prominent part. It doesn't mean the actors are irrational. We, sh we shouldn't see emotions and rationality in dichotomous terms. Indeed, the, the actors have been strategic actors as well, right? So, in terms of strategy,、uh, there are a few distinctive features. Like it's a leaderless movement. We all know about that. So they emphasize flexibility. In terms of like the, this, the water philosophy, and also you see a coordination among small groups, and and also how the social media play a very important role in facilitating this. Another point about the leaders' movement is that because there's no centralized leadership giving you know directions, and hence there is diversity. But it's important that it must be a united movement because they learn from the umbrella movement that you know. We have to be united, and that's why they stress this idea of unity, and hence a, a, a kind of unity in diversity that we are seeing in terms of the norm of non-divisiveness. Like、um, we fight on each in his own way, no snitching, no severing of ties, being the mottos here. And hence, in particular, we see the co-strategy of non-violence and militancy、uh, under this framework. Um, so I、uh, then move to, move to militancy here. Now I won't go into the details. You are all very familiar with the developments, but I just want to highlight the fact that 
Well, I want to stress the role of agency, meaning that the young people are indeed um, act, active actors having their, their, their uh, way of thinking, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They have the capacity for action. They have the strategies, et cetera, et cetera. But what happens does not depend only on agency alone. But is that actually a product of you know, the interactions among different contextual and contingent factors? In particular, there have been some earlier milestone experiences that come to shape um, the protesters' sense of political agency that spurred continued continue, um, militancy in the protests. Uh, I want to highlight to you specifically what happened on June the 12th. Uh, actually, there were two protest sites. Uh, the confrontation with the police uh, led successfully to stall the second reading of the bill and also the police firing the tear gas outside the CICIT uh, tower uh, left a very strong imprint you know, in, the, um, in, in, the, uh, in the mind of the protesters, and that gave rise to commit, committed um, resistance from then onwards. Another very important or milestone experience was the storming of the logical building on July the 1st. It sort of you know, signified a moment of victory and liberation and that helped spur pro, uh, protests and marches in other districts and also helped and popularized from then onwards the, um, the slogan of liberate Hong Kong revolution of our times that sort of you know, articulated the sense of revolutionary consciousness. Now how about escalation of protest militancy? We did see you know, militancy. We also you know, have seen escalation here. And I want to say that it's actually a result of both intended and unintended ele elements that lead us to rethink this idea of agency. In terms of context, we all know, um, because uh, you have, uh, we have political authoritarianism, i.e. a government you know, not being prepared to concede on authoritarian grounds, police brutalities, uh, that's shocking to many Hong Kong people, and also uh, thug violence. I've been reminded that the word thug is, um, uh, carries some racist connotation, so I should use another word next time. Okay. So we do how, see how Hong Kong people's sentiments have been escalating over time from add oil to resist and then to revenge. But some, some accidental things did happen like you know, some trigger events, the, the death of a university student that was entirely unexpected. But that helped scale up the, the Dawn Operation campaign and leading finally to the fierce confrontations at the two university campuses in November. But again, while the Dawn, campaign, Dawn Operation campaign has been planned, the way it unfolded was not entirely expected. First, because of the trigger event, and second, you see, it turns out that it was a kind of positional warfare in which people, the people were besieged and trapped, and that were not intended by the protesters, right? That contradicted also the be water strategy. So, before I come to the concluding slide, I want to uh, also bring to your attention a few dilemmas in the movement. The issue regarding militancy certainly is a double-edged sword. It could help build resistance, but it could cross a dangerous line and result with a loss of control, say in the case of vandalism against shops with a different political stance, or you do have instances, but I wouldn't say that's a norm, that doesn't reflect a generalized norm, but we have cases of protest or violence against people on different grounds. What might be some of the ethical dilemmas I've been citing uh, the works from my colleagues here, so myself have mentioned uh, very briefly this idea of populism because it's a leaderless movement and people, that there's an element, a dose of populism there and people are particularly concerned about effectivity, strategy and action rather than on ethical dilemmas. Joseph Chen at Hong Kong, you a philosopher, talks about the ethics of violence on defensible and indefensible grounds, but Tula Ho here, right, talks about how the ideology of aliency uh, in, has imposed silences within the movement, and likewise, Francis Lee also talked about the dilemmas of solidarity in undermining critical discussion and silence and dissent, etc. We need to reflect on all these issues 
uh, at the same time, especially among um, academics. The last slide, by way of conclusion, I want to bring up some issues for uh, perhaps discussion. And now, for youth agency, of course, we emphasize the, the, the young people as autonomous actors. That's the idea. But we have to see that at the same time, as a sociologist, agency is also shaped by culture and society. What we are seeing in the young people today actually reflects some larger changes in society, some generational change. We talk about the uh, post-90s, we talk about the millennials, we talk about you know, new generational consciousness. Given this, we then perhaps shouldn't just focus on the behaviors of particular individuals, just looking at you know, their unlawful behaviors. We, I think we should come to terms with the larger social and general, generational change in our society. I think the government should come to terms with such changes. The other point is that agency does not act alone. Agency interacts with context and contingency. And hence, when it comes to the question of who should be responsible, who should bear the brunt of responsibility, it wouldn't be just those who break the law because they want to push um, forward democracy. It's a very complicated issue. Another point is that they are actors, but young people are also victims. So we should uh, also reflect on the problem of legal and political authoritarianism today, right? And hence, the last point, I think it's also for us to call upon perhaps a broader framework to think about legal and social justice. I'm not trained in law, and I hope I could be inspired by my legal colleagues here to talk about possible you know, ways of thinking or rethinking legal and social justice without taking just a narrowly legalistic uh, point of view, but considering larger social changes at the same time. So the rule of law, our core value, we should hold on to. Democracy should be there. We talk about sovereignty. We talk about uh, democracy as a universal principle. But I think there are also studies in the literature who address this idea of restorative justice, saying that we don't have it in Hong Kong. We don't have it in Hong Kong. We might have this in North America, in Canada, Australia, in, in some other countries in the world. This idea um, was brought up in the past in Hong Kong. The uh, Hong Kong government did not sort of take it seriously. So it might not apply to the current situation, but one never knows. Shouldn't we have, shouldn't we also you know, evoke some new ideas and draw on experiences from other countries to think about possible ways of thinking about justice, or even integrative justice. Law is not just, just there to punish. I think law is there to, is there for reconciliation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Pang, uh, who gives us uh, um, a um, very good uh, uh, study of the young people involved uh, in in the protests and uh, the uh, concept of agency and the relevant uh, militancy and so on. So, um, last but not least, uh, we we now come to. Uh, Professor Eliza Lee, uh, who is from the Department of Politics and Public Administration of this university. Uh, she has uh, written uh, extensively on Hong Kong issues, uh, and her latest research projects uh, include social movement dynamics uh, in a hybrid regime, which I believe is the case of Hong Kong. So uh, may I now invite uh, Professor Lee to address us. Hello. Is it, is it on? Okay. Uh, thank you very much. So um, it looks like I'm the um, only um, political scientist uh, on this panel. So um, naturally, I'm going to talk about something very boring, uh, which is uh, <laughs> the political regime. Um, okay. Actually, my <laughs> 
No, my, my um, in some ways, my talk um, um, is uh, linked to uh, the point uh, raised by CK, which is the, the, the structural perspective, and especially the China factor um, and the internal colonization of Hong Kong. So uh, a lot of my talk actually will be about you know how this um, internal colonization uh, has occurred um, through political institutions. Um, so my, my talk is um, um, extracted, is, uh, part of my talk is actually um, uh, from a journal article that uh, will be forthcoming. Um, this uh, article is entitled uh, United Fronts, Clientelism and Indirect Rule, Theorizing the Role of the Liaison Office in Hong Kong. It's going to be forthcoming in the journal Contemporary China. So, um, so I'm going to speak on civil unrest from a political regime's perspective. <clears throat> now, from the point of view of authoritarian regimes, uh, civil unrest is certainly a very important concern because it can be a potential cause of what political scientists called authoritarian breakdown. Studies in the past two decades have also asserted that Authoritarian regimes have various strategies for maintaining their stability and endurance. So the purpose of studying this question, well, obviously for us political scientists, is not to offer advice to dictators uh, on how to prolong their power. Right? So rather, it is about understanding where the cracks are and what are the best strategies to, for bringing about change. So with this in mind, my question is, what does the latest civil unrest say about the endurance of the political regime in Hong Kong. Now, the literature has shown, the relevant literature has shown that, um, contrary to expectations, authoritarian regimes do not always resort to repression as a way to deal with public dissent. I mean, after all, uh, repression is a very uh, costly uh, tactic. Okay? Um, in fact, more often than not, authoritarian regimes that endure are the ones who try to co-opt a wide range of societal interests. Now, um, many scholars in political science and especially the local scholars on Hong Kong politics have now used the concept of hybrid regime to describe the nature of the political regime in Hong Kong. Uh, simply put, a hybrid regime is a kind of authoritarian system that runs elections but does not fulfill the minimal requirements of a democracy. So elections and hybrid regimes do not result in a change in government, and the autocrat will remain in power. On the other hand, elections in these systems are not just instituted for window dressing purposes, and rather, uh, the legislature is very often an institution for co incorporating oppositional forces and broadening, broadening the basis of support for the ruler. According to an article by Jennifer Gandhi and Adam Przeworski, entitled Authoritarian Institutions and the Survival of Autocrats. The endurance of these regimes hinges on the ability of the ruler to mobilize cooperation and re prevent rebellion. In order to do so, policy concession is important, particularly when the opposition is strong. So if we take this as the yardstick, then uh, the behavior uh, of the Hong Kong government and their political elites um, lately apparently um, cannot be explained by the literature on hybrid regimes. I mean, it, it simply doesn't make sense. So judging from the behavior of this government in the past decades so or even longer, I would say that there were numerous instances where it was very rigid and unwilling to make policy concessions, even when political opposition was strong. Um, and in that regard, its behavior was crisis prone uh, if not even suicidal. Um, the situation in some ways has actually worsened since 2012 under the last chief executive and the current one. Now people have pointed out that um, Hong Kong is different and indeed unique and a lot of the speakers here have actually pointed out the, you know, the very fact that Hong Kong is not a sovereign state. Um, I think some of my colleagues have described Hong Kong as a subnational hybrid regime. Um, so in, in the sense that then its governance is very much affected and structured uh, by the central government in Beijing. Um, and uh, just also echoing uh, Pai Guan's uh, talk about multiple sovereignties, um, you know, one can look at Hong Kong as a liberal enclave uh, within a strong authoritarian state. 
Um, thus, um, my point, and, and this is also the point of my um, article, uh, that is in order to make sense of the behavior of this uh, subnational hybrid regime, we need to theorize the configuration of power between Hong Kong and the Chinese party state. Um, now, for, in order to understand, we need to go back, of course, to you know, the mass rolling in July 2003. And we all know that after that, uh, there was an interventionist turn in um, the Chinese party state's policy towards Hong Kong. Uh, the liaison office, which is uh, the official agency of um, the, the Chinese party state in Hong Kong, um, became the second governance center as it became increasingly visible in Hong Kong's elections and public governance. Um, and in empowering the liaison office as the second governance team, a key component was the significant increase in the size and number of United Front organizations. Now, United Front organizations have a long history of presence in Hong Kong, uh, traceable back to the 1940s and even earlier, uh, when the Chinese Communist Party started to sponsor political parties, set up schools, uh, labor unions, um, run newspapers, and even movie companies, etc., through which it could promote its ideologies and recruit followers. Now, as we can see, after 2003, United Front organizations were increased in large number. Uh, well, it was actually um, increasing in number in the 1980s and 1990s during the transitional period, but after, the 19, after 2003, it was like a new wave of expansion um, in the number and size of these organizations. Um, now, company, um, you know, including uh, regional federations to neighborhood-based organizations, hometown associations, welfare agencies, etc. Now, um, these um, United Front organizations now form an extensive and closely knit network, and they have become the basis uh, for the liaison office to build a political machine, uh, discipline political elites, and maintain their cohesion, control the executive, and counterbalance civil society. <clears throat> so this comes to my theor theorization, and that is, um, through the liaison office, the Chinese party state, and that is Beijing, has been able to carry out indirect rule in Hong Kong. <coughs> Technically, the liaison office has turned itself into the de facto quasi-ruling party of Hong Kong. Excuse me. With the United Front <coughs> organizational infrastructure operating as its para party machinery. Now this mode of indirect rule, and by the way, indirect rule is actually a form of colonial rule, okay? So at least in colonial studies, we know that uh, there are two approaches to colonial rule. One is direct rule and one is indirect rule. So I'm not gonna have time to um, elaborate on uh, the principle of indirect rule here. But suffice to say that um, in the case of Hong Kong, this mode of indirect rule, which is sometimes <coughs> ridiculed by the media as Sai Wan Xi Gong or Xi Huan Zhi Gang, has been crucial for the political regime of Hong Kong to endure. Um, through building a political machine and securing, securing voter support, it ensures that provaging political parties control the legislature. Um, and until very lately, the district councils. And secondly, through assuming the role of the patron with the power to reward and punish, the liaison office is able to discipline the behavior of the probation camp and ensure that the executive will enjoy stable majority support in the legislature. <coughs> Sorry. Mm. On the other hand, um, this mode of indirect rule has also generated new problems and new crises. In supporting the executive's uh, policy making, the liaison office most often adopted a very heavy-handed approach, demanding that, um, pro-Beijing politicians vote and speak for the government's policy, no matter how unpopular it was among the public. The executive also became highly dependent on the security of majority support offered by the liaison office, which did little to help improve popular approval. I think it, especially after 2012, 
uh, the liaison office uh, was highly involved in um, the um, election committee's election uh, for returning the chief executive and um, pressuring the uh, members of the probation camp to vote for the candidate favored by Beijing. And by so doing, I think the, um, the chief executive became more and more reliant on the liaison office because uh, basically the person had very weak power base even among the key political and social elites. Um, and so in, in so doing, I think it's, um, uh, the chief executive became basically rely on the liaison office to discipline political elites and push through a couple of policies and it sowed the seeds for um, more serious crisis. So um, we all agree that the social insurgency that erupted in June 2019 against the extradition bill was the outcome of the uncompromising attitude of the chief executive backed by the heavy-handed approach of the liaison office. And uh, besides all the core professional sectors and even pro-Beijing politicians in this case were all under immense pressure from the constituencies to oppose the bill, okay? Uh, but notwithstanding this opposition from almost every walk of life, um, the liaison office in May 2019 actually summoned all the pro-Beijing legislators, uh, all the CPP, CPPCC members, NPC Hong Kong delegates, <coughs> instructing them to support the bill unequivocally and order that the bill must be passed. So with such a strong backing from, um, from the liaison office, um, Chief Executive Carrie Lam basically totally disregarded the boiling social out out outrage and finally leading to the massive protests and violent state society confrontation and the worst, um, the outbreaks of the worst political crisis ever. So um, now as we can see from um, this case, um, and we, um, there's a dilemma here for the autocrat. Uh, which is that, on the one hand, um, the objective of the indirect rule is to prevent authoritarian breakdown. Um, in the past <coughs> one and a half decades, it has enjoyed relative success, meaning that, in some ways, um, the political order of Hong Kong after 2003 has been artificially maintained by an external machinery built by the Chinese party state. The mode of indirect rule, however, as carried out by um, the, the Chinese party state, carried out by Beijing through the liaison office, has disincentivized policy concession, which is one very important mechanism for bargaining with both elites and the mass and the political opposition, thus preventing authoritarian breakdown. So um, indirect rule through undermining this mechanism has actually sold uh, the seats of its own demise. So um, <coughs> I think I'm gonna stop here. Um, be happy to um, answer questions later on. Uh, thank you very much to Professor Lee, uh, who provides an analysis of um, the, the nature of the Hong Kong political system and the, the role of the, the Chinese government uh, in, um, in um, participating uh, in Hong Kong's political system. So um, we have uh, heard all six speakers speaking, and according to the uh, program, uh, we uh, we still have uh, um, some time for for discussion. So I think uh, we should finish uh, at one fifteen p.m. for lunch. So we will have at least half an hour of discussion. So what I would suggest is that. Um, those of you who have questions or comments can raise your hand and maybe we'll collect uh, three questions or comments at a time. So after three people have uh, raised questions or comments, I'll ask relevant speakers to respond and then we'll take the, uh, the, the next round of questions and comments. So uh, who would like to begin? Uh, 
Yes, yes, please. Yeah, yes, Professor John Burns. Um, thank you. Uh, I've heard you talk about the impact of the civil unrest, and maybe I put it to you. Maybe I maybe I put it to you that um, the civil unrest has resulted in each instance in the government caving in. Start in 2003, the government caved in. Start in then 2012, national and moral education, the government caved in. Occupy, we don't have the um, party-backed universal suffrage plan of the government. It didn't work. And now this time, the extradition bill has been withdrawn. Now, of course, there are many other demands. So you could say that if you're looking at it from a rational perspective and protest, it's increasingly violent, it's very effective. Policy does change. Thank you. So um, uh, maybe we'll collect a second question or comment. Uh, Yes, on this side. Hi. Uh, yeah, my question slash comment is actually inspired by Professor Lee, Professor Pang, and Professor Wong's uh, presentation. So I'm just wondering if we can actually uh, speak of a anti-capitalist and conscious in the movement, uh, because it seems to me that uh, while certainly some participants are disappointed by the failure to achieve. Uh, upper mobility in the system. Therefore, that intensified the anger toward the government. But if we think about uh, the documentary about Edward Long, uh, Lun Jin Kei, whose slogan, Gong Fu Hong Gong, Si Doi Ga Ming, has come to define the social movement, right? Now, if you've seen the uh, documentary, someone asked at the end of the documentary, what would you do if you're not activist? He says something like, well, I don't know. I, don't, I just want to maybe get a job and play guitar all the time. So he's not talking about upward mobility, meaning he's rejecting the suffocating one-dimensionality that has long defined Hong Kong capitalist system. You go to college, you, buy a, you save up enough money, you buy an apartment, you get married, you have kids, make sure you send them to international school. This is not what he's into, right? So also based on what Professor Peng and Professor Lee was talking about, alternative institution building, creating a new political community. So what we're seeing is not just civil unrest. We are seeing a new kind of institution, uh, the yellow economic circle, people organize themselves to go to airport, pick up protesters, uh, underground medical clinics. We are seeing institution building. And this reminds me of this book, uh, Envisioning Real Utopias, by the late sociologist Eric Olin Wright. So um, even though no one's actually talking about, you know, uh, you know, capitalism is bad or anything. So I just wonder, there's like, maybe, maybe we can talk about the anti-capitalist unconscious, which is something that I think a lot of traditional Marxists and people like Mark Rubio have totally missed. Thank you. Um, so are there any questions or comments from this side? Yes, uh, yes please. Thanks very much. Two things quickly. One, there was no comment about this, uh, the factor of 150 people coming each day into Hong Kong from the mainland. The question of density, the question of the mainland presence growing slowly but having an impact in terms of the larger, some tipping point seems to have occurred. And so I wonder if that's a demographic kind of question. Um, that, that I wondered if, uh, if anyone would like to, to comment about that. And as to the question of a, a great piece about events, but events then say, how long is an event? And what is the sort of the cycle of event? And what determines the duration uh, as you've seen it in these you know, umbrella as well as uh, uh, the most current one? Thank you. Thank you. So we have collected three questions and comments. So uh, maybe we'll just invite anyone among the speakers who would like to to respond to to speak. Uh, so I won't ask everyone 
to speak because there will be other questions uh, and comments. Yes, Professor John, uh, John Wong. Uh, let me take the question uh, from my left side. I, I think there's a lot of uh, credibility to many of the claims that we are becoming less uh, f there are fewer homo economicus around us. There are more political uh, politicus. But then at the same time, I question how real that claim is. Uh, and I put that to the test in my classroom quite a bit. Um, all my students are telling me, oh, I don't know what, what they, we're going to do. The, the world is coming to hell in a handbasket. Hong Kong is not doing well. So OK, what's your dream job? Well, to have a good life. OK, what is good life? then you realize that they're still quite defining it in quite materialistic terms. I want to have a good living space. I don't want to work in a farm because it's tough, certainly not a factory. And I want to work in the tertiary service industry. Air conditioned office in Central will be best. <laughs> so I, I feel that the, the uh, teleology that we have been um, receiving in um, primary and secondary school, you move from primary industry to secondary industry to tertiary industry, and that's the one-way street is alive and well. And I find that regrettable. Um, and I usually uh, turn to them to say, is that true that you know, there's no manufacturing in any developed countries? I mean, pull out your cell phone. That's US for Apple and Samsung, and you have semiconductors from Taiwan, Singapore, and all the phones. I mean, there's nothing wrong with the manufacturing sector. Now, I think what is important for us to understand is not really the uh, um, um, certain point in time how people feel, but the, the first derivative, how the mobility is changing. Um, when I showed you the graph just now of the 20% increase year after year of GDP, the, the tide is rising. It's like a tsunami. You cannot help but be lifted by it. Um, but then in today's environment, the, second derivative, the first derivative is, is actually declining. Um, and I think in particular, um, alluding to the China factor that my fellow panelists have, um, have talked about, vis-a-vis -vis China, that is very intense um, in association with Glenn's question. In the 70s, China was alive and well, and there were people flooding down from the mainland just as well. But they were the Atans. They were the Biu, Biu Jies. Now we're the poor cousins, because they are going to our Canton Road and all our expensive shops, taking away everything. And, and they have started on our formula and everything else that would be more um, essential items for us as well. So I, I think the political dimension um, does not quite pay homage to the changing nature of China itself. I was only tongue in cheek when I said one country, two systems, whether it was political or economic. And I think one can push the argument to say that one country, two system has certainly become one country, one system, especially in an economic sense. I find, fewer I find few places as capitalistic as the major urban centers in China. And in that sense, Hong Kong and China have converged. And that is also creating a lot of discomfort in people. Now, to push the argument a step further, many of my students also tell me that they, uh, um, they are my lifestyle in Taiwan, precisely what you're talking about. Get a good job, play guitar, nothing wrong with that. But then when I ask them why they do not go there, life is too tough. So in that sense, Taiwan has solved a political problem that Hong Kong has not solved. But the economic issue that haunts Taiwan is the same that haunts Hong Kong. It is not just the rise of a political China, but the rise of an economic power in the mainland that we need to contend with. And I think we need to um, face it um, in conjunction with our political aspirations, not really in isolation from it. Thank you uh, for the pain. Very quickly to respond to John, just want to remind you that he's teaching at University of Hong Kong and I teach in riot universities, the University of Rioters. So I talk to my students, many of them, I have to say, do not want to, do not follow that path that you described. I can only say this uh, university differences <laughs> or major difference. I mean, uh, in terms of the student population, I teach cultural studies, so you can imagine. Um, I don't see a lot of my students are in, still interested in doing a job under an air-conditioned office anymore. And they are really investigating other types of um, living conditions and living um, uh, ways of living. 
uh, which I think it's very positive, as uh, Charlie was saying, that I do think that this generation are thinking beyond the kind of economic model that we have been teaching them uh, for many years. And I also think that, I don't know, other colleagues would have the same impressions. To me, the younger generation is much more persistent in living a different economic life. That's my impressions. And uh, like for, for those who support the yellow economy you know, regime or the ecology, uh, I'm not saying that you know, the older people do, are not as committed, but I have to say that younger people are really committed. They, a lot of them do not take MTR. I mean, that's, it's still very beyond my imagination. They prefer buses, which is great. I think this is all amazingly material life that they are changing that I found most impressive. They are willing to, even some of them, discard uh, their uh, octopus card. They are doing cash coins. And so they are willing to live a different life, which we don't. Um, we, yeah, exactly. We feel that that was much more difficult. No, but then there's a different ways of doing economy, not necessarily following the kind of more culture and that we have to buy a, you know, six million dollars house to start with. So to me, that was much more encouraging in that sense, but I don't know. Yes, uh, yes, but we'll see, Katie. Hi, uh, very briefly, continuing this conversation, I think based on the many young people in the front line that I talked to in the past seven months, I think what they want um, are both. There's no choice between, there's no, you know, they think they can have all and they should have all in the sense that necessity and freedom, politics of necessity, politics of freedom, these are no alternatives that they should have um, uh, a good life, but also uh, doesn't mean that they that part of good, good, that good life package um, uh, doesn't have uh, democracy and freedom. And I think many people now, even the young ones, see that inequality in Hong Kong, this, the lack of mobility, has to do with the concentration of political power um, because of the government is not democratic, and that's why many vested interests, uh, including red capital. Um, and the pre-existing um, legacy capital, uh, British capital, has been controlling uh, a big parts of the economy, um, monopolies in different arenas of life. And so if there's inequality, it has to do with the kind of uh, is the distribution of political power is at the root cause of that. And um, so, so the response is, I think young people these days, they aspire to a more holistic view, um, both economic and political freedom uh, are part of and essential parts. They don't see a trade-off because they think they have experienced it. Um, I think before these kind of decades of erosion of freedom and rights, um, young people in Hong Kong have lived through a period when, when um, they feel like they can have both. So that's what I want to report from uh, my findings in the field. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Okay, I just want to respond to the remark that policy does change, right? Um, yes, but first, at what cost, right? So we have young people uh, being arrested, right, suffering from critical injuries, um, also committing suicide, so at what cost? Number two, yes, policy sometimes does change, but the system never changes, right? So we don't have uh, senior officials uh, having to resign for the mess they have created. And why? So that goes to the root problem. And hence, people are asking for demands beyond just a change in the policy. They are asking for institutional change. And fourth, and that's what we are not seeing, right? And fourth, in the process of the government responding to the protests, more problems are created. And that sort of reveal institutional, some fundamental institutional problems that we are seeing, like with you know, policing and, and, and authoritarianism and all that. So even policy does change. 
um, people are looking beyond the policy to address more fundamental values. Thank you. So maybe we'll take another round of questions and comments. Uh, yes, uh, sorry, at the back first and, and then uh, in the front and then in the middle, yeah. Young people today who become over 50 or middle age by 2047. Young people today try to maintain the way of living, the uh, democracy and freedom beyond that. Recently, uh, Carrie Lam mentioned if the president wants the country to system work, there's no reason why the one country to system will, will not continue beyond 2047. With, the, with, with, with this uh, elite panel, would you comment whether that one country to system can continue beyond 2047? Would this idea be susceptible to the Chinese authority. Thank you. I think uh, there is uh, some people in the middle. Yes. Uh, this yeah, you first and then the lady. Uh, this is not exactly a question, but it would be very brief. I'm responding to the comments and the presentation made by Professor John Wong and Professor Eliza Lee. Um, I think. Uh, Yes, in the earlier days of the colony of Hong Kong, there has been uh, uh, an emphasis of prosperity and stability on the environment. And that slowly migrated to something like Jiao uh, Manju. But I think uh, because I personally have been researching on the history of Hong Kong and written on the history of Hong Kong, I think the history of Hong Kong was very much interrelated with the history of China for the obvious reasons. And Hong Kong was made up of mainly immigrants from China. Reason being, China did not have stability or prosperity. For most of the 19th century until the middle, or I would, I would say until lately, until before the open door policy, China was full of chaos, poverty, and deaths, like millions, tens of millions of deaths. That's why we have the refugees. So the people in Hong Kong took it as like, this is a safe haven, this is where we are going to cherish our stability and our prosperity. And then I think the most important thing with this movement right now is freedom. And because of the persecution in the mainland for, for, for I would say, two centuries, Hong Kong was a, was a heaven of freedom and prosperity. So that was a given. So the problem right now is that we don't have the freedom that we used to have. So I think this is exactly what we're facing right now. And about prosperity, about uh, material life, I think uh, in, 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 in one of those uh, unrest in, uh, in, in Taiwan, uh, probably in the end of September, there was a, an airline pilot, age 30, he was arrested. He was charged with uh, rioting, with serious uh, consequences. So the guy did not lack of any materialistic uh, advantage. In Chinese, we call that a yan zhang sing lei zhou. So this guy was not fighting for money. He was fighting for something very different. So I think this is the only movement that I have, I have observed in the last 40 years that had very little, if nothing, I would say nothing to do with, um, with economic uh, mobility. It was something beyond economic uh, aspirations. And my, my, my uh, reaction to uh, uh, Professor Eliza Lee, is that uh, you mentioned about indirect rule. I would say in the colonial days, the founder, one of the founders of this university, uh, Governor Lugat, uh, Sir Frederick Lugat, he was an architect of the British Empire of indirect rule. But that was a very different kind of indirect rule. And I think that, the, the, I don't know wh wh whether you are relating or equ equalizing uh, the colonialism of the British Empire with the uh, current regime from Beijing. Because I think right now we, the, the, the movement, my last comment is, and this is the end of it, 
This seven months movement is gradually exposing the true nature of the regime in Beijing and is opening the eyes of everybody who's, who's willing to look at it objectively. So I think this is a very important thing that we should bear in mind. Thank you. Thank you. I think in the middle, yes. Um, I think I'm a minority and I'm quite scared to speak out, but I feel that I, out of um, yeah, righteousness, I should speak. Um, I have a question for Elisa, Eliza Lee. Um, you described the China liaison office as a um, political machine, and you kind of described the interference from China as indirect rule. Um, so I, 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 I quite, I'm quite surprised because I think our ruling principle in Hong Kong is one country, two systems. And your speech and some of the other speakers, their speech is focused on, so I try to focus on two, two systems. Like you cannot have anything to do with me, like China, you have to stay out of Hong Kong. But you kind of focus too much on two systems, not one country. Remember, our principle is one country, two systems. And if you focus too much on two systems and not mentioning about one country, you're breaking the, you are actually violating the basic law. Right. Um, also, uh, what for the one country idea? What the one country can do? They can do nothing. So what can they do? I think um, we have. This is the question um, that we have to think about. I don't think the basic law is very clear about this. When it's written, it's written in, in a kind of rush way. Um, um, so lots of details are not laid out. So I think in future, we have to, the whole Hong Kong have to think about what one country system, two system actually mean. What one country, what China can do with Hong Kong. Um, yeah, okay. And also the last, my last, uh, my last comment is uh, about John Wong's um, last uh, reaction to his uh, students' uh, choice of future. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I think uh, like they choose, they kind of choose stability and uh, prosperity over democracy. They may not think too much about um, what what is good for Hong Kong, what is the, what the future should be like. They think too much on materialistics, right? I, I agree with you, but I think it's also in terms of freedom, is their free choice. One should not be put lower than the others. Like, if I choose stability, stability and prosperity, I should not be blamed as, oh, you have been so um, uh, low grade, and uh, those who choose democracy should not be described as the righteous, as the, uh, as the righteous person over the others. So I, I think um, it, if you talk about freedom, we should be more wider, um, we, we should be more um, um, open, open-minded. In, in our discussions. Thank you. I, I think, yes, maybe uh, we'll, we'll take one or two more questions since this may be the last round, uh, given that time is running out. I very much enjoyed the, the, the panel, but in, in, in response to, to the last question, I, I want to put a question to Lai Kuang uh, Pang. You talk about multiple sovereignties. My fear for Hong Kong is that when we talk about sovereignty, I'm reminded of Carl Schmitt's definition of sovereignty. Sovereign is he who decides on the exception. And as the last question reminded us, uh, uh, that that sovereign is probably to be located in, in, in Beijing. And if Beijing is confronted uh, with the choice between one country and two systems, it is likely to, to go uh, uh, for, for the one country, which is not the outcome I personally desire. But I, I think it's a very, very real possibility. So, so in that way, uh, my, my fear is that if Hong Kong proves anything, it is that the talk about multiple sovereignties or sovereignty shared uh, in this world is, is uh, wishful thinking, that the political reality is, is much harsher than that. Thank you. Uh, I think in the middle, yes. Hello. Yes. Uh, this morning, we heard uh, several speeches from professionals, sociologists, and academics. 
uh, everybody talk about the young people. Uh, but I'm, I'm disappointed that uh, nobody mentioned the elderly and the weaker sector of society. Uh, all my relatives and friends in the past six months have suffered, not physically, but psychologically. Uh, they are very worried. Uh, many people don't dare to go out of their flat, even in daylight. And, well, I think they are showing signs of depression. How, how do you help them? How does the society, sociologists and the society as a whole help this bigger and bigger aging population of Hong Kong? Thank you. Thank you. I think maybe we can take a last, uh, last question or comment. Uh, uh, sorry, there are maybe two then at the back and in the front. These will be the last two. Thank you. Um, very interesting presentations and great to see such gender diversity on the panel. My question is to ask about the gendered experience of the protests and if that also has uh, been a um, disruptive model to the structures that we've been discussing. So, sorry, uh, do you hear clearly? Uh, you, you hear clearly, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then, um, yes, in the front. Hi, uh, I want to ask a methodological question, especially regarding eventful sociology. So I think I want to ask a general question about how does the actual lived experience of people the elderly, young people from different universities of different background or people at the marginal, um, marginalized positions, how does the experience figure in your framework of analysis? The eventful sociology, I really like it. It's, you know, it's glamorous. It's, you know, the focus on contingency, context, disruption, everything Foucauldian that I love. But then I just feel uh, that is still very structural. All the questions that people ask, all the res radical questions, the revolutionary ethos, I think they are still focusing on macrostructure. But under this big umbrella, there are many events. And within each event, there are a lot of stories about people's life, the actual experience, which will disrupt these analysis, this very macro analysis, and to show that they are may not be that revolutionary, and may not be that radical, and may not be that romantic. So I just want to, I just hope in a conference that will study historical sociological perspective that we will bring in this micro, actual people's lives and stories as a way to question the framework that we use and the portrayal of the movement that will just give more, I mean, credits to people's contribution from different walks of life or their comments, which may be positive, negative, maybe from different political stance, and maybe they are all important. Thank you. Thank you. So that, that concludes uh, the, um, the collection of comments and questions. So we'll leave it to the uh, speakers to decide uh, whether you want to uh, respond. Uh, and uh, we, 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 we hope we'll finish before half past uh, one. So, uh, so maybe we will just uh, uh, go along the order in which the speakers are seated. OK, so um, I, I guess there are one or two comments that were directed uh, to my uh, talk. So um, I'm going to try to respond to them um, comprehensively. OK, so um, the first question about um, this concept of indirect rule, uh, I think this gentleman is correct that uh, indirect rule as a strategy was first uh, sort of theorized uh, by uh, Lugard, which was a very famous uh, British colonial official. And it was used to describe his uh, strategy of a rule in some African um, colonies. Uh, but on the other hand, I, I have to say, I do not think that the British colonial rule in Hong Kong was a form of indirect rule. I think uh, it, uh, indirect rule was applied to some extent to uh, some of the indigenous uh, um, clans in Hong Kong and new territories. But I think for most part of Hong Kong, it was actually a form of direct rule. 
okay, because the British uh, colonial institutions, including the legal system as well as the, you know, and all the anti-government system was transplanted to Hong Kong, right? Uh, so, uh, but then I, um, but but if, to go back to the concept of indirect rule, I think uh, one um, um, defining uh, characteristics of ind indirect rule is that um, the uh, ruler, instead of exactly you know directly transplanting its own institution and its own personnel uh, to rule over uh, a foreign territory, uh, they would um, actually adapt and utilize the existing institutions um, of um, of that territory. And as well, um, 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 appoint um, agents uh, who very often uh, were indigenous elites um, of the local people uh, to rule over that territory. Okay, so that's, so that's the general idea. So um, in that sense, um, I think the um, the kind of strategies and the system that have been developed by the liaison office uh, since 2003 sort of fit into that um, general. Um, uh, description, uh, but I would say um, um, that um, the, this, the the mode of indirect rule that's instituted by the liaison office uh, has a lot of um, major problems, and one of which is that its social basis is actually extremely weak. Um, um, I don't think most of the, even though they try to come up with all these uh, united front organizations to be trouble, the kind of elites that they uh, actually um, kind of raised and nurtured very artificial. Um, I don't think they have much, I mean, if, if you just leave them alone, I don't think they have originally have much connection uh, with the local, with the, gen the majority of the Hong Kong people, okay? Uh, so, uh, which is why we very often feel so at odds with uh, a lot of the so-called uh, pro-establishment elites, and that is because, um, you know, with, without the, its artificial uh, support uh, from the liaison office, uh, they probably would not you know, command any leadership position or any legitimacy or any you know authority from the local population. So, so I think this is an inherent uh, weakness um, of the that mode of indirect rule. Um, and um, I I think uh, the uh, but but I think more um, important and more seriously, and I'm going to make a very bold claim here um, that um, I'm I think towards um, exactly because of this internal. Um, you know, um, the weakness of indirect rule and the way that we are seeing uh, this whole institution is actually, I mean, it, I think it, it, it claimed itself to be relatively successful for a while, but I think it sold its own seats of uh, damage. And, um, and because of that, I'm, I'm afraid that uh, what's going to happen then is that increasingly this form of indirect rule might be migrating, at least in some policy areas, towards a form of direct rule. Uh, and I think we are seeing, witnessing it now, uh, in in some ways. And so, um, so sadly, you know that I wasn't intending to respond to the question about what happened in 2047. But um, at this point, it, it doesn't look very, um, 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 you know, optimistic from that point of view. Uh, but um, but again, of course, uh, history is an open process. I mean, you know, so many possible, you know, structural variables, uh, you know. Uh, may change, and, and of course, you know, a lot of uh, events might happen. So, um, so you know, I, I think uh, 2047, in that sense, is still largely an um, an open uh, process. Um, so, in the the point about um, um, I, I hope that um, you know, um, I, it, it was also not my intent to uh, you know uh, instill um, you know in, emotional response, you know, to use a term uh, indirect rule, which is so. Uh, closely um, associated with uh, colonialism, uh, but, um, but apparently, you know, internal colonization exactly was uh, what um, a lot of people are now, you know, experiencing um, in their relationship vis-a-vis, -vis, um, um, you know, the central government. Um, and uh, so, to, to just go back to uh, just think about um, one country, two systems, and our um, um, Chinese officials have always uh, asked us to. Uh, correctly understand uh, the basic law uh, um, so I think uh, my understanding of the correct understanding of basic law about one country two system is um, that uh, we go back to um, you know the Sino British uh, joint declaration in the 1980s it was about offering um, Hong Kong a high degree of autonomy 
um, and um, that except for um, self for for national defense um, and um, and and foreign affairs, you know, um, all the domestic affairs should you know rest within uh, the hands of uh, Hong Kong and the local people. And um, you know, uh, and that the socialist uh, or the communist uh, political system will not be applied to Hong Kong. So, um, so in, in many ways, that I think um, the the kind of um, you know um, political regime as was constructed by um, you know um, Beijing through the liaison office, I think, um, is extra legal. Okay, and it sends, in that sense, I would say it was not the original, obviously not the original intent uh, of the Basic Law. Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, and, and um, so I have not intended to uh, overlook uh, the role and the situation of older people because I myself uh, am, uh, um, am with you, actually, <laughs> age-wise, right? Yeah. So, uh, but we just can't cover everything. So, in terms of the role of the older people and also the role of women, now for women, um, I know of colleagues uh, who have been uh, working on that. So from different angles, one is to look at the various roles played by women, and also issues relating to gender, like you no know, sexual violence. So Susan Choi from CUHK, and also Petula Ho would be looking at the issue from a different perspective, addressing feminist issues relating to perhaps uh, the ideology of valiancy. So we do have scholars you know, uh, looking at such issues. Now regarding age, I have to admit that the idea of generation actually is not uh, a analytically very strong concept. Uh, a, a more useful way is actually to look at it from the perspective of power, power. But then that is to understand who are in power, who belong to the marginalized groups, okay? It is from this perspective that we see how power might be tied to other you know, social groupings in terms of age, in terms of class, class would be, from a, social, from a sociological point of view, would be an even more important concept, right? Um, how people might be marginalized in economic terms, in social terms, in political terms, right? But I, I bring forward this idea of generation because we are witnessing generational change. So we have to come to terms with this. But it doesn't mean that um, we shouldn't also pay attention to First, intergenerational dynamics. Second, intragenerational, intragenerational dynamics. In other words, we shouldn't be looking at any single generation as a homogeneous group. We shouldn't assume that it's just similarity, sameness in, in the same age cohort. So I think the approach from a sociological perspective is to consider diversity. Because you are asking me for a, an approach. I couldn't give you an answer. But I think that would be a more useful, a more perhaps um, uh, uh, fruitful approach. That is to look at diversity, to consider diversity. It could be you know, multiple stories, multiple angles, um, multiple kind of you know, um, possibilities. So uh, relating to, uh, finally, a remark on China's role. That's a very intriguing question, right? China's role. Are we violating the basic law? I don't think so, right? Because the basic law allows us to talk about one country, two systems, right? So, but the thing is, from an academic point of view, it is a, a fact, a sociological fact, that anything is subject to interpretation. There's no one single interpretation. And the fact is there are inherent tensions in this formula. So we are seeing the tensions. We are trying to resolve and address the tensions in innovative ways. And about the role of, of the nation state, indeed Hong Kong is aware of very complicated, the wider picture, about the role of the city within the national framework in the wider international context. And hence Hong Kong people are aware of international geopolitics in terms of how China is related to the world, in terms of this unique position of Hong Kong in, in the national framework. So I don't think precisely because people, uh, Hong Kong people are well, well aware of the role of the nation state, but they have a bigger picture. They have a bigger picture. Okay. Yeah, uh, and CK. Very briefly, because there are two questions about events, so I just want to address uh, really, really briefly 
Um, the notion of event uh, for me is is not a political project. That means is I'm, I don't intend it to empower marginalized groups, which of course is a worthwhile project. For me, event is for analysis. So you invoke that eventful lens to see the interaction between structure and people's practice, and sometimes the causal priority is not what we always assume, and that's the utility of this perspective. So it's not meant to just look at the micro. This goes against exactly what eventful analysis calls for, which is this micro-macro linkage, but with a kind of slightly different causal priority that you give to event and practices rather than structure. But it's always structure because the significance of event, it can change structure. And I, as a sociologist, I don't believe that any practice can change structure. No, that's why the definition of event is that these are rare happenings. And so not anything that happens under the sun that is being done by powerful, powerless people, any single person is eligible uh, to be defined as events according, if, if I'm taking an you know, eventual analysis as intellectual project, it's not, I'm not a politician, I'm not an activist uh, in, in, in what I'm saying today here. So, but but it's, you want to collect all these stories about how people experience, lived experiences of the movement and what they do during the movement by all means, but I don't think that's what I try to mean when I say eventual analysis. Uh, very, uh, yes. Yeah, very quickly to the questions about sovereignty. I very much agree with the with the um, Carl Schmitt kind of like obsessions, particularly in China among certain state uh, intellectuals and spokesperson. But uh, what I'm trying to do is precisely to challenge that. I do think that that uh, kind of uh, understanding of sovereignty is very, very um, problematic in the sense that what I'm suggesting about multiple sovereignties refer not only to the uh, international or uh, the uh, you know happenings or dynamics within a country, but also without the I mean outside the countries in the sense that multiple so so sovereignties it's itself not an extremely useful um, categories um, to describe the actual happenings in the world because there are a lot of like um, 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 forces and uh, collaborations and mutual inferences outside the sovereignty. Um, uh, outside the nation state. So in China, one of the reasons why it is not able, and I think Beijing was not able to respond very well to what's happening in Hong Kong, in contrast to what is happening in Xinjiang, for example, is precisely if there are other levels of power structure operating outside China. Um, the global order, you know, and all, all sort of like capitalist, uh, um, uh, cap, uh, global capitalist operations. So I do think that we so sort of denationalized sovereignty is not just a political vision, but also it really describes what really is happening. So it's up to the nations and up to uh, uh, states uh, to try to incorporate and understand how power manipulates and operates in many, many different ways, not in terms of just simply, you know, a locus of power conditioning, whatever they want. I think there's a small myth sovereignty, it's more myth than actual descriptions. Uh, let me address the question on uh, freedom loss first, um, because actually I think it gets to uh, my argument about how the colonial government um, went about shoring up its legitimacy to rule the city. Um, I agree that there's been erosion of freedom. I beg to differ on whether freedom was available to Hong Kong in the earlier days of the colony um, to, to to quote your words, um, censorship was alive and well. Our THK did not gain independence until the 70s. The police was highly corrupt until the mid-70s. Um, many of the rights that we are guaranteed now, they are part of the Bill of Rights in the 1990s. So what I find incredible was how uh, how, the, how the colonial government actually packaged is uh, image in the 70s and the 80s and in the waning days of a colonial regime, how it uh, strategized a graceful exit. So on that score, I think that's the uh, that's something that I want to look more into, and um, that's the uh, 
that's also our natural in, um, inclination in the city to project the golden year of Hong Kong of the 70s, 80s, or the 90s, uh, extrapolate it um, to something that a historian might not agree with. Um, on the Beijing showing its true colors in the more recent past, I, I don't know if I would agree with that either. I thought it was painfully clear to me on June 4th, 1989, what the true colors were. And in terms of the universal suffrage promise, I am with everyone who demands universal coverage, suffrage in Hong Kong. On what basis are we making such demands? The basic law, there are two provisions in there guaranteeing gradual um, transition to universal suffrage in both the electrical and our election of the chief executive. Whether you like it or not, Article 23 was an article in the same document that preceded those are the two articles. So back to the question about one country, you know, I think Beijing was pretty insistent even back then too. And it is the um, willingness of us in Hong Kong to turn a blind eye to certain issues, be it 1989, be it uh, the initial writing of the um, Article 23 that I find quite perplexing. And lastly, to address the issue of uh, my, my interaction with the students and um, their uh, maybe materialistic um, desire still, uh, I don't mean to pass judgment at all. Um, I am merely trying to highlight the internal inconsistencies of their political demands and the materialistic desires. And I am very thankful that we're in the moot court of the Faculty of Law, which is not an echo chamber, so we hear the different voices representing different parts of the political spectrum. I don't think it's just the old people. The closest we got to a referendum in Hong Kong was one week, one Sunday in November, when 70% of the registered voters voted, three million strong, and it was landslide victory for, for the anti-establishment camp. But then I think we easily gloss over the fact, because um, that camp won so many seats, that 40% of, of the voters did vote for the establishment. So for, for us to not try to understand how the rest of the city thinks and to, and to hide in our own echo chambers beyond Facebook, WhatsApp, or um, selective um, social settings would be detrimental to our uh, resolving the crisis that we have today. And I, I'm thankful that we have an audience that is willing to participate and uh, speak their minds. Yes, uh, regarding the question about the sustainability of one country, two system, Speaking in my own capacity, I myself uh, is quite pessimistic that uh, the relative successful implementation of uh, one country two system in the early years of the handover uh, rests on uh, the kind of certain degree of trust between Hong Kong and mainland, but uh, it's uh, disappearing rapidly in recent years. Uh, it's quite lamentable that in 2006, uh, 2008, uh, according to HKU poll, uh, around 58% of Hong Kong people consider themselves as Chinese, but now I think the proportion is below 20%. Uh, so, and uh, I noticed that there is a uh, lack of ground of compromise between Beijing and Hong Kong, particularly young people in Hong Kong. and. Uh, it's, uh, so it results in a vicious cycle, uh, in Hong Kong and, uh, uh, really can't see much light for, uh, for one can shoot two system future development. And, uh, I, while I have low nostalgia for colonial rule, I do give credit to the colonial government for, uh, setting up a, Independence inquiry into 1966 Star for Rewards, even before the disturbances was over. Uh, maybe so. Uh, my will is um, Beijing and Hong Kong government is uh, are to blame mainly for the worsening situation. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so we uh, we will have to finish this session now. Um, we will resume uh, at 3 p.m. here uh, in the afternoon. And may I may, may we thank all our distinguished speakers for contributing their insight to to, to us today. <laughs>